Okay, so it is 930. So I think we will get started if that's okay, Madam <clears throat> Clerk. Of course. All right, so it is, excuse me, my voice all of a sudden is cracking up. <laughs> it is June 10th, 2021. I want to welcome everyone to uh, County Council. Uh, spring has arrived and in celebration of uh, spring, I brought in this morning some peonies. I don't know if you can see them over my uh, shoulder. I'm sure many of you also have uh, your gardens blooming and particularly the peonies, which I just love. My backyard is fragrant and bright and uh, just love to see the peonies and others. Um, okay, so I will call this meeting to order and Madam Clerk to roll call, please. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, we have all council members in attendance with the exception of councillors Potter and Body. I will notify you when they join the meeting. Thank you very much. And we will get started then. Next on the item, uh, next item on the agenda, excuse me, is the land acknowledgement. So I will say that we acknowledge with respect the history, spirituality, and culture of the Annie Ishinabek, the Six Nations of the Grand River, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat, Wyandot, Wyandot peoples on whose traditional territories we gather and whose ancestors, ancestors sign treaties with our ancestors. We recognize also the Métis and Inuit whose ancestors shared this land with Andes waters. May we all as treaty people live with respect on this land and live in peace and friendship with all of its diverse peoples. And those words are particularly um, important in light of the events that have uh, taken place recently uh, in London. I'm sure that everyone is uh, giving some thought uh, to what's happening, uh, happening there and indeed happening throughout our country. Um, declaration of interest, item number four. Is there any declaration of interest pecuniary or otherwise? Uh, seeing none, and Madam Clerk, I will check my second screen. I do not see anyone. Uh, if one does arise, I would ask you to uh, declare it at the time that you uh, discover it during the course of the meeting, if that's so. Item number five uh, is adoption of the minutes, and we 5A is the um, County Council and Committee of the Whole Minutes, which were dated May 27th, 2021. It has been moved by Councillor Keaveney and seconded by Councillor Clumpus. Is there any discussion? of those minutes? Seeing none, I will then call the question. Is there anyone opposed to adoption of those minutes? And so I'll say that that is carried. Thank you very much. Item number six, six uh, A is the Board of Health uh, minutes. Uh, they're dated April 23rd and the Board of Health special, minute, uh, special meeting minutes uh, dated April 28th and May 12th, 2021 and the Board of Health executive uh, meeting minutes dated May 7th and May 10th, 2021. Board of Health has been busy, uh, as you can imagine. Item number six is moved by Councillor Patterson and seconded by Councillor O'Leary. Um, Dr. Era is present, so perhaps I will have Dr. Era uh, present an update for us. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, through you, the uh, highlight of, of the minutes and the updates uh, are related to two fronts, uh, uh, COVID and uh, the opioid crisis. For, for COVID, uh, we continue and until this day to have uh, excellent uh, control over the pandemic. In Great Bruce, the number of outbreaks in regulated settings, hospital, long-term care, retirement home, uh, child care are, are zero. There is one uh, outbreak uh, related to um, a rooming home uh, where uh, there is a challenge uh, that, that has been met with success from uh, the different partners in Great Bruce. The challenge is related to the fact that 35 residents of this rooming home uh, use uh, drugs and they have uh, specific needs to, to maintain uh, control if there is an outbreak and, and there has been an outbreak with 11 cases. There has not been an increase in numbers since uh, the declaration of outbreak. And it's worth mentioning that uh, the, the um, partners around the table uh, in Grey Bruce uh, uh, came together to address this situation. The management of the outbreak uh, case and management uh, stays with public health and we take the lead on it. Uh, the challenge of isolation brings the need to provide life necessity, whether it's food or uh, ensuring a no withdrawal from drug use. 
and, and the different partners uh, did that. Uh, United Way uh, provided food, the municipalities uh, provided support on many fronts, whether offering potential housing if we needed to isolate somebody outside or not. Um, EMS has been the lead on the ground. Uh, I cannot repeat it enough. Uh, um, Gray EMS and Bruce EMS in general in, in the pandemic have contributed. Uh, in, in this case, they have been the lead. And uh, RAM hospitals, uh, the mental health uh, aspect of it provided by different partners, uh, naloxone and, and uh, methadone uh, treatment um, are other aspects of it. Again, it, it really highlights the success of our ability in Grey Bruce to collaborate and, and mobilize public health, mobilize the partners to address certain need. Um, the vaccine front, we have reached uh, 111,000 doses in, in Grey Bruce, and that is consistent with the provincial direction and we're getting our fair share. And we have the capacity to proceed further and faster if, if need be. Uh, reopening plans are being reviewed by our um, staff for different sectors. And we're, I am confident we can provide the same uh, level of safety that we provided last year with the reopening. Uh, the um, uh, other update on the vaccine front is completing the fire and uh, police uh, vaccination last week, second dose, uh, along with the healthcare workers um, and we considered uh, the first responders, uh, police and fire to, to, to be part of the healthcare workers um, category since they attend to calls. And, and that was completed uh, last week. Uh, the, um, this weekend would highlight uh, another success for Grey Bruce. Uh, Peel region, um, with the help of Bruce Power, uh, built a hub with a capacity of 9,000 uh, vaccines per day. And uh, we had deployed a couple staff to help in the management change and uh, sharing the knowledge of operating the hub. Uh, Peel recently called on us to send the entire team for one day to, uh, to ensure that they can see the process uh, and, and we can demonstrate large scale operation. So that would be on Saturday, uh, about 25 uh, of our team will be there and uh, I'm sure it's going to be a success in, in uh, providing that uh, knowledge to Peel and the uh, change management required with, uh, with uh, such operation. Um, one final update, uh, uh, Mr. Warden and Council, is related to the opiate uh, crisis that all communities in, in Ontario has been uh, dealing with. And um, uh, if you recall from three months ago, our board passed a motion or direction to staff, to myself, to uh, draft our resolution to Alpha. Alpha is the Association uh, of Public Health uh, Agencies in Ontario, um, and, and they had uh, uh, we had uh, our uh, Alpha meeting uh, this past Tuesday where this resolution passed, and the resolution in, uh, in essence... Um, calls on, on all agencies and level of government in Ontario to capitalize on the success that public health has been as a leader in mobilizing partners to address the uh, COVID crisis or the COVID pandemic and uh, channel uh, and, and use the same momentum to address the opiate crisis in Ontario. And, and the fact that the resolution has passed, adopted by Alpha, uh, will definitely have impact on the strategic direction of public health and the different um, agencies uh, that deal with uh, opiate going forward. So I look forward to implementation of that resolution in Grey Bruce and, and the result of it across Ontario as well. That's my update, uh, Mr. Warden, open to questions as always. Thank you very much, Dr. Arrow. Um, I gotta say that the Peel uh, partnership uh, bravo on that. Uh, that's really exciting to hear that we're sending an entire team uh, down to Peel and that uh, we'll be able to demonstrate this uh, hub model uh, in, in full force. That's, that's awesome. And, and it's also a sign of uh, things that we've been doing throughout the pandemic uh, with respect to working with other units. I know that our paramedics were down in uh, Windsor 
And uh, we uh, have worked with other uh, units in terms of sharing uh, resources and whatnot. So we're all in this together. This is really exciting. Uh, Sue, um, is there anything that you wanted to add? I should say Councillor Patterson. <laughs> My apologies. Fine, <laughs> uh, yes, uh, I do. I have three items I'd like to highlight. So good morning, uh, Warden Hicks and County Councillors. Over the past couple of months, the Board of Health has received letters of support from various municipalities. And I want to take this opportunity to say thank you to those municipalities for taking the time to share that support with the board. It is appreciated. Uh, next is uh, the 2021 budget has been approved by our board and the budget reflects the temporary shift to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic while distributing and administering the various vaccines to the population of Gray and Bruce counties. The Ministry of Health has indicated that one-time extraordinary funding will be available to cover excess costs incurred related to the COVID-19 response. The portion that each county is to contribute has remained stable from the previous year. And this is due to the provincial government's mitigation funding for 2021, covering the change in the formula. formula you remember it was 75-25%, which is now 70-30%. And also uh, due to the Ministry of Health's 100% funding of additional funding needs incurred because of the response to the pandemic. In other words, Gray and Bruce counties will be contributing the same amount as 2020, which is the number that was included in our Gray County budget. And as Dr. Era referred to on June 8th, the, at the annual conference for public health agencies, I can say Dr. Teresa Tam, Canada's chief public health officer gave a shout out to Dr. Era and the staff of the Gray Bruce Health Unit on and commented on the progressive and innovative model of the hockey hub. So that was pretty nice to hear from Dr. Tam. Thank you, Warden Hicks. Thank you, Councillor Patterson. Uh, I will now open it up for questions from anyone else who may have any questions, Council. Councillor Desai and Councillor Potter. Thank you. Councillor Desai, go right ahead. Thank you, Ordinance. Good morning, members of Council. Uh, Dr. Farah, thank you for the report. Um, just a quick question with if you could provide clarity on who can register for the second dose at this point. Um, I've had some, some trouble myself trying to decipher the communications that has come out. Uh, and I mean, on social media, it's been a wide range of people that have said, oh, well, I've, I've booked my second dose. So if you could provide some clarity on that. Um, and second is a statement, uh, just wanting to congratulate the team um, with, with, uh, with regards to the um, adoption of the Hockey Hub uh, in the Peel region. Uh, thank you. Thank you through you, uh, Mr. Chair. The, uh, the second dose uh, is available for uh, age groups, for healthcare workers, definitely, and it was provided in Gray Bruce. Uh, for age groups, it was approved for the 80 plus, and there was a plan to be approved for 75 plus. I will have to check uh, our website and, and I can email uh, right after if, if need be, just because these numbers change quite uh, frequently. And uh, uh, I, I don't wanna mention the exact day uh, age, if I'm not 100% sure if that's all right with uh, the council. Perfectly all right. Yep, thank you. Anything else, Councillor Desai? Uh, no, thank you, my word next. Uh, Councillor Potter. Uh, thank you, and I apologize for being late, but uh, it's timely because I just uh, come came back from getting my second dose. Uh, because I am immunocompromised, so I'm, I'm now fully vaccinated. Uh, and the uh, Hockey Hub uh, at, at the uh, Julie MacArthur Center in Nolan Sound is uh, extremely efficient. It's, it's really something to watch, something to uh, be part of. Uh, I wondered uh, if we are going to see even more vaccines coming. Uh, is the flow going to start moving along a little uh, more easily. 
Uh, and I, I also suggest that anybody that has questions call the health unit. I did, and uh, they were extremely helpful. And uh, uh, I were able to help me make my booking for my second dose too. So, but I just wondered how the vaccine supply is, is coming and whether we are expecting to see more in the near future. Dr. Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we have seen increase in the uh, supply of vaccine uh, after mid-May, after uh, increasing the, the doses to 100% of our allocation. Uh, the first uh, part of May, we were supported or receiving around 50% of our capacity, the rest of it going to the hotspots. Uh, so since then, we have received the full capacity around 8,000 uh, doses, and uh, we continue to hear that there will be more vaccines coming forward. And, and uh, the plan is to have increase in that as well. Thank you very much. Is that it, Councillor Potter? Yes, that's good. Thank you. Wonderful. <clears throat> I don't see any other hands, Madam Clerk. Yes, Councillor Keaveny. Oh. And I will just let you know, Mr. Warden, that uh, all members of Council are here now. Council Body has joined us as well. Thank you very much. Um, uh, on my screen, my very, very top row must be the people who have their hands up because I'm not seeing the very top of the top row. So that's why I'm missing those hands. Uh, but Councillor Keaveny, you're next, go right ahead. Thank you very much, Mr. Warden, and uh, good morning, everyone. Dr. Ray, I wondered if I may ask for your opinion and recommendations on mixing second doses. Do you suggest that it's okay to do so because we hear a lot of uh, mixed discussion um, on that front in the media. And I'm just wondering in particular for those of us who did receive AstraZeneca the first time around, what your thoughts are for our second doses. So uh, NASI, the National Advisory uh, on Immunization in Canada um, uh, made, um, issued a statement uh, um, that uh, mixing vaccines is safe for uh, the same type of vaccines or the uh, mRNA vaccines. Uh, we still wait for the provincial direction on that. And my understanding in the near future, in the imminent future, before the end of the month, definitely we will receive direction that it will be allowed to mix vaccines in Ontario. At this point, it's not recommended uh, by the province. And Mr. Chair, if I may, uh, the age group is 70 plus in Ontario for a second dose. Very good, thank you for that clarification. Uh, Councillor Keaveny, anything else? Uh, no, not at this time, thank you, Mr. Warden. Thank you very much. I believe that is now it for hands. That's correct. If that's the case, then I will thank you very much, Dr. Arrow, for that uh, update and to Councillor Patterson as well. And I, I think it's time to call the question on the motion. Is there anyone opposed to approval of that motion? Then I will say that is carried. Thank you very much. That was item six. We're now on to item seven, good news and celebration. And I'm looking for hands. Okay, Councillor Robinson, I see you up in that first position. I don't see your hand, but I'm assuming there's a hand there. <laughs> Go ahead, Councillor Robinson. Well, thank you, Mr. Warden, and good morning, County Council. So I'm very pleased this morning to share with the County Council that the provincial government yesterday announced that natural gas expansion will take place in Newstat. Approximately 219 homes and businesses will be able to connect for the first time as a result of this natural gas e expansion program. Certainly good news and celebration fits into this announcement. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Thank you, Councillor Robinson. Next, I believe is Councillor Mackey. Thank you, Warden Hicks. Good morning, uh, County Council. Uh, just wanted to uh, congratulate and acknowledge a, a local athlete from the uh, township of Chatsworth. Uh, Bailey Hooper was part of a uh, five person rowing team at a recent regatta in Italy and they won the gold medal which qualified them for the uh, Paralympic Games in uh, Tokyo this summer. So uh, certainly congratulations, and we'll be uh, rooting for Bailey uh, in Tokyo this summer. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor Mackey. And I apologize, Councillor Robinson. I went straight to Councillor Mackey without saying that <laughs> I, I also was quite excited to hear about that new expansion of uh, natural gas is uh, so uh, important for many, many uh, people. There'll be a lot of excitement around that project for sure. Thank you, uh, Mr. Next, Morgan. Next is uh, Councillor Soever. Yes, thank you, Mr. Warden. A um, um, couple of things. Um, on July 3rd, there's going to be the second uh, drive through Lobster Fest um, at our uh, Beaver Valley Community Centre. So this is a drive through event. Um, you can drive through and pick up your lobster dinner. It includes uh, lobster, barbecue chicken, a fresh baked roll, baked uh, potato, salad and dessert. So it's more than one meal. Um, and um, the, there's also lobster tools available to purchase. Uh, there's a well, health and wellness beauty pack that was donated and um, we're, we're selling those for $25. It's a hundred dollar value of beauty products. And you can also order wine um, to take out. Um, and so that's, that's new this year and that will support our local uh, wineries here. Um, the, so that's on July the 3rd and all the proceeds go to uh, the Grants and Donations Committee here in the town of the Blue Mountains. Um, so the, the except for the wine is uh, going, that's organized by the Legion. So all the proceeds of that will be going to the Legion. Of course, we know the Legion has not been able to uh, have its normal uh, revenue from sales of beverages. So we hope this will help them catch up in that regard. Um, we also have uh, Hindle's Hardware. Uh, for those of you who have not been to Clarksburg, it's well worth the visit. It's their 50th anniversary in business. It's an old style hardware store. If there's something you can't find, if something breaks in your house and there's something you can't find, all you have to do is go to Hindle's and, and, and Mr. Hindle will find it for you. Uh, there's a rumor that he has one of everything that's ever been made. <laughs> attest to that fact a few years ago when my dryer the the springs were going on it so I, I guess it was the washing machine the springs were going and the thing was jumping all over the floor I just took one of those springs and I said do you have anything that can match this so he went downstairs came up with a huge box of assorted springs and I was set to go until I could purchase a new one so Hindles is truly a place to visit because um, it is, um, you know, has one of everything. It's a very old style hardware store. And so it's their 50th anniversary in business. Um, the Hindles bought it 50 years ago. So that is uh, an, an event, a great event. And he's been serving our community where the big box stores, you go there and they can't find stuff. Then you first, you should go to Hindles because um, um, it does, you can find any, if you can't find it there, then you're in trouble. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you, Councillor Soever, and you've done a great job promoting uh, Hindles. And I got to tell, tell you, I love old, <laughs> old style hardware stores. I could spend hours in them because I love tinkering with all those, uh, those little gadgets. Uh, so I'll have to make a point of visiting uh, when I have a, when the time is right, when I have a chance. I was also thinking I could use that health and beauty uh, aid package uh, that you were talking about. Uh, but anyways, I digress. Uh, next is Councillor Columbus. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Warden, and good morning, everyone. Um, this uh, is a, an award. I, I'm going to show you a little bit of bragging here, if everybody can see this. We, we may have uh, heard this before because the award was presented on June, in June from the Canadian Association of Municipal Administrators to our staff for the Willis Award for Innovation. It was the 2021 recipient um, of this award for those uh, communities under 20,000. And the award is for the, uh, the um, installation of a program, Report a Concern over our website portal, which monitors and tracks customers' concerns and uh, actions that, uh, that we need to attend to. So, very, very proud of our staff for what they have done and for this award. So thank you for your indulgence. Thank you for that, Councillor Clumpus, and congratulations indeed to the staff at Meaford. 
Uh, next is Councillor Boddy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Warden. Uh, as, as we know, June 21st is always a fun day because it's the longest day of the year, the northern solstice um, or, or summer solstice for us. It is also National Indigenous Day. And on that day, the city of Owen Sound will be dedicating the uh, name uh, uh, Name Gitche, uh, Name Oh, how can I blow this at this moment? Um, I'll come back to it. The, the naming of the bridge of uh, 10th Street and we'll be uh, doing a celebration with that uh, dedication uh, at, at the bridge and uh, very much looking forward to it. Some of the details have not been roughed in totally yet because of, uh, you know, as we're getting acclimatized to the, uh, to the uh, COVID rules, but it's something that we look forward to. Of course, I think it was uh, 2015 that the report, a lot of it uh, was based on, on um, residential schools, came up with 94 recommendations for reconciliation. And of course, we all know the news of the last uh, 10 or 12 or 15 days from Kamloops. And uh, that struck a chord, I think, with everyone in Canada. So we're really looking forward to the naming of the bridge uh, on June 21st. And uh, if you're around, we hope you can Oh, join us. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Body, and I, I share. Um, <laughs> I, I have sympathy for you with respect to the pronunciation of the names because I struggle with Annie Ashinabek and the Haudenosaunee, but I'm practicing. <laughs> Gichi Name Wikwadong. There we go. There you go. Gichi Name Wikwadong. Well, I'll have to work on that one. Uh, next, uh, Councillor Desai. Uh, thank you, thank you, Warden Hicks. Um, uh, unfortunately, what I what I'm about to say is is neither good news nor celebration, but it is something, in my opinion, that uh, perhaps should be said in some form. Uh, since our last meeting date, which was May 27th, there has been some news that has dominated the columns and airwaves. Uh, from the 215 lives which were uh, cut short due to what can only be described as attempted uh, cultural genocide, to four lives being ended by blind hatred for, of another person's uh, culture uh, to an orphan nine-year-old. It's hard to say, I find it hard to say anything when these things happen. Um, Gandhi once said, recall the face of the poorest and weakest man you have seen and ask yourself if this step that you contemplate is going to be any use to him. Which leads me to ask, what can I say today that, that can improve the times tomorrow? Uh, what can I do today to, to make a better tomorrow? Uh, these questions, quite frankly, lead me to think twice before saying anything on, on either of these, these matters. Uh, and perhaps that is wrong in itself. Um, after all, uh, if someone did say, silence in the face of injustice is complicity with the oppressor. I do want to say, though, uh, that I remain uh, proud to be a Canadian. I'm an, uh, I'm an immigrant. Uh, I'm, I am a Canadian. Uh, those are not mutually exclusive. I'm proud of the advancements that Canada and Canadians have made uh, to better society in making the world a better place. I also recognize that we still have areas where we need to make progress. I recognize that we need to do a better job speaking for the un underserved and the underrepresented. And I hope to do better in those areas. Because if I can be better myself, my community will be better for it. And if my community is better, then my country will be better for it. And if my country is better, then the world that we leave for the generation tomorrow will be better for it. I'll conclude by saying that every child matters. From the 215 who are but the tip of the iceberg, to the 15-year-old who lost her life to hate, and the 9-year-old who lost his family to a despicable act. Uh, thank you for your indulgence, uh, Warden Hicks. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Desai, for your very uh, thoughtful uh, words. Um, thank you. Uh, Madam CAO, uh, is, that, is your hand up? Yes, it is. It was, okay. Go ahead. 
Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, the, the staff have a number of things that uh, they'd like to uh, celebrate with you this morning, and I'll start off by uh, calling on Kevin McNabb and the results of their recent uh, paramedic week. Kevin? Good morning, Council. Uh, just wanted to give you some uh, good news in regards to our paramedic week this year that we celebrated from May 23rd to 29th. We focused on the great work the paramedics do every day, but also some of the work that they've done through the pandemic. And our, our tagline was hard times don't last, but strong teams do. And uh, part of this was to hold a virtual food drive. It's something we've never done before. Usually we would go to two or three sites during that week with our ambulance and fill it up. Uh, this year was held virtually uh, through donations at uh, four uh, different grocery stores, uh, Meatford Independent, Sarah's Own Sound, Grants in Hanover and uh, Thornberry Foodland. And uh, happy to report that uh, they the raised $7,697 over that period of time. And uh, just to give you a running poll, uh, Rick Trombley started this back with one of our paramedics in 2010. And uh, Colin kind of grabbed the torch in 2018. And uh, since that time, they've uh, been able to uh, get over 80,000 pounds of food. So uh, congratulations to uh, them and, and all the paramedics that uh, take part in this. Thanks so much, Kevin, and congratulations. I, I really think it speaks to the um, support that you and, and your team have in the, with the public. Um, next, I'd like to go to Jody McEachran from our IT department who has something to celebrate. Jody? Thank you. Um, at the recent uh, annual conference for the Municipal Information Systems Association uh, of Ontario, we were awarded um, a, an award for uh, excellence in municipal systems for our work with Municipal 511. Um, so Municipal 511, it's, uh, it's been discussed at the council table before, but it's a web-based GIS application for managing and communicating issues on our road network. And the award recognizes what we've done with this that goes above and beyond a straightforward implementation. We've really been leaders um, as, a, as a consumer, as a user of this software. Um, and we've done uh, some, some fairly progressive things with it. Um, we've led an implementation at the county that includes all of the nine member municipalities, both through public works and fire. Um, we have great adoption within our own transportation. And that data, uh, I think one of the most significant things uh, is feeding into InterDev's CADLINK program. So now if there's any issues on the road like construction or an emergency closure, that data is available to paramedics um, you know, live in their trucks and they can respond accordingly, whether that's, uh, whether that's adjusting their dispatch or just being aware of uh, more issues on the ground. Um, furthermore, paramedics is leading a an integration with more private content for their responses, including uh, issues around specific locations or uh, things like the, the locations of our um, public access defibrillators. We've also uh, been the first of the client for this software to um, do integration, integrations with our in-house GIS, and we've uh, openly shared that with other municipalities if they're interested. And um, I, you know, I would just like to, to thank the people who work on it. If it wasn't for member municipalities and, uh, and Pat's team feeding data into this, um, and, and even a lot of our neighbors, this, this software now services um, half of the municipalities in Ontario, um, then we certainly wouldn't see that benefit on the paramedics and the emergency response side. Um, and, and Joel Meyer, who was our GIS specialist up until this winter and has left for Waterloo, was uh, integral in in uh, leading a lot of the work that we've done. And it's now handed off to Sean and Matthew Wartman who are doing uh, great work. And I'd also like to thank uh, Doug Alport, who's our vendor on this. He's absolutely fantastic to work with and, and he provides great service and a great product. Thanks so much, Jody. And yes, I totally kudos to everyone who's involved in this. And, and I wanna recognize you too for joining the board of MISA. I think uh, that kind of contribution back to, uh, to your profession and your sector is so important. So thank you for doing that. Mr. Warden, if I may, the last thing I'd like to speak to this morning is to provide some recognition and, and celebration of someone who did so much for Gray County and Gray Roots. And I'm speaking of um, Mr. Bob Alexander. Um, Bob was born and raised in Owen Sound, 
but he was a dedicated museum volunteer for over 30 years, including several terms as the chair of the Grey Roots Museum Board. His greatest contributions lay with the creation, development, and interpretation of the Blue Water Garage. He was equally passionate and supportive of Grey Roots' efforts to honor local veterans, as he himself was a proud son of First World War veteran, a Korean War veteran himself, and a member of the Owen Sound Legion. Mr. Alexander was honored with a 2015 Lieutenant Governor's Ontario Heritage Award for Lifetime Achievement, as well as an Owen Sound Cultural Award for Volunteer of the Year and many other richly deserved accolades over his lifetime. Um, he's also uh, our Sarah Johnson, our planner, Sarah Johnson's grandpa. So um, I just wanted to say that he will be missed. He made a huge contribution. He was wonderful with all of the students who came to Grey Roots to help them to learn and understand their history. And Grey Roots and all of Grey County have benefited immensely from Bob's generosity of spirit, unwavering dedication and profound knowledge. We are all better for having known him and the sadness we feel at his loss is only a measure of his greatness. So. Thank you to Mr. Alexander. That's everything, Mr. Warden. Thanks. Very kind words, uh, Kim, and we certainly appreciate that kind of uh, volunteerism. And you don't see uh, much of that, do you? <clears throat> okay. Um, I can't tell from my list, Madam uh, Clerk. Is there anyone else? No, sir. Okay. I saw Councillor Hutchison pop up in my first row. So I wondered if uh, <laughs> he had something to say, but he doesn't. All right, so that's it for good news and celebrations. Thank you uh, very much. Um, we will then turn to item number eight, which is adjournment. It's been moved by Councillor Milne and seconded by Councillor Burley that we adjourn. Um, I'm gathering no one will be opposed to that, will you? <laughs> Anyone opposed? Right. So we'll take a second to switch uh, gears and move over to Committee of the Whole. All right, which one is this? It's over here, I'm ready to go. <clears throat> All right, so I'll call this meeting uh, to order. This is the Committee of the Whole on June 10th, 2021. Um, is there any declaration of pecuniary interest? Or declaration of any interest? Yes, Councillor Keaveney. Go ahead, Councillor Keaveney. Thank you, Mr. Warden. And I would declare a declaration of interest on item 6A. Uh, PGR-CW-0821, the addendum to the uh, Hilton Heads Heights condominium uh, report on the grounds that uh, my husband was involved as a real estate agent with the, this developer and the integrity commissioner has advised me to declare on anything uh, connected to uh, any matters he was involved in. Thank you, Councillor Keith. Whoops. <laughs> it looks like we're having some technical challenges, but Councillor Keaveney, thank you for that. Uh, is there any other uh, declaration of interest or pecuniary or otherwise? Excellent, then we'll move on. Uh, we're on to item number three, uh, delegations. Uh, the first delegation is going to be from uh, BDO. We've got Victoria Watson and Tracy Smith. Good morning. Hi, good morning, <laughs> Tracy. Hi, would you like us to take it away? Please, yes. Okay. Uh, um, so I'd like to thank the council for inviting us here this morning. So I'm Tracy Smith and Vic Victoria Watson is also on the call. Uh, we'd like to thank Mary Lou and Joanna and their team for their assistance during the audit. The audit was performed virtually and poses some uh, 
Additional challenges as we learn new ways to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence. Um, Mary Lou and Joanna were very open to new ways to exchange information and very patient as we learned to navigate our new virtual world. So we really appreciate the support they provide and we do wanna recognize the completeness and quality of the working papers that they um, provide to us during the audit. As your auditor, we have responsibility to communicate with those charged with governance on an annual basis. In your document um, section, uh, uh, about five documents down, um, there's a report titled 2020 Draft Audit Financial Statements, County of Gray. It's a white report cover and, and, and Victoria has it up there on the screen. Um, we will start with that report and uh, Vicki will also put, um, uh, we'll start with that report. The report contains all the communications required under auditing standards. Many of these items are the same as prior year as the content is, is prescribed by auditing standards. Therefore, we do need to communicate these uh, uh, every year to you. I will provide a brief summary of the communication and Vicki will provide a high level overview of the draft financials in appendix one. There is also a blue graphical report in the document section at the uh, top titled 2020 year end report County of Gray. Uh, if there is time, Vicki will highlight some key financial indicators from, from that graphical report. Since we are virtual, we'll take some um, questions at the end of the presentation. So Victoria on page um, page three of the report, uh, there is a, a summary of the items to be discussed. The status of the audit, the financial statements are draft and can't be released in final until council approves the financial statements. Once the financial statements are approved, we will need outstanding confirmations, signed management let, represent, let, representation letter as of the, the report date and subsequent event review up until that uh, approval date. Amounts are material. They would affect the decisions of users relying on the financial statements. Materiality was 3,250,000. Performance materiality was just over 2 million. And we use the performance materiality to focus our audit and identify amounts to be tested through statistical sampling. Thresholds of 10 to 20% of the performance materiality or about 240 to 200, 240 to, to uh, 400,000 are then used for standard and analytical procedures. In terms of audit findings, our audit strategy and procedures were outlined in our planning report. There were no changes to our plan procedures and no issues were identified in our testing performed. No additional risks were identified during the audit. Internal control matters, we are required to report to you in writing any significant deficiencies in internal control that we have identified. During the course of our audit, we did not become aware of any significant weaknesses in the design or late implementation of internal controls that were tested during the audit. On page four of the summary, uh, there is a sample representation letter included in appendix B. Um, unadjusted um, differences, we are required to disclose to you if we find any amounts during the audit that have not been adjusted. Your uh, management team, they do a very um, detailed analysis for the year end and all adjustments were made uh, with the exception of an error um, that the management team discovered with the amortization of capital assets. Um, since changes to the calculation of amortization in the software um, for an individual asset is difficult and time consuming. It was decided to adjust in 2021. Um, and since the amount is not material, we can still issue a clean audit opinion that the financial statements are not materially misstated. Independence, we confirm that BDO is independent of the county and can issue an independent audit report. And um, finally, for um, auditing standards require us to communicate on an annual basis, basis a discussion on the uh, responsibilities to prevent and detect fraud. Uh, we are not aware of any issues and Vicki and I can be contacted directly if council does have any concerns. That is a summary of the communication. I'm not going into detail with the remaining report. Um, I will now turn it over to Vicki to go through the numbers. 
Thank you, Tracy. Um, so I apologize, I'm gonna scroll down here a little bit. So hopefully you can just turn aside a little bit while I scroll, if you uh, don't mind. I'm just going through the remainder of that um, report to get to Appendix A, which is the independent auditor's report. So as part of the package, um, we do provide um, starting, it, th this package is numbered part uh, two, but it is page 11 of that individual PDF uh, document that was provided. So when we're looking at the independent auditors report, um, there are no significant differences or, contact or content changes in comparison to the prior year. It does um, include our opinion in the first portion of the independence auditor's report, and it is a clean audit opinion, and that is the highest level of assurance that we can provide. The remainder of the report to you goes through the responsibilities of management and those charged with governance, which is counsel for the financial statements and the auditor's responsibilities. We have dated the audit report um, on page four with June 10th, um, as it is anticipated that council will accept the, um, or it is hoped anyways, that council will accept the uh, draft presentation of the financial statements today. I am going to next go to the consolidated statement of financial position or the balance sheet, um, as those may, may be a bit more familiar term for those um, in business themselves. Um, and this goes through a snapshot in time at December 31st, 2020 um, of the um, financial assets, liabilities and non-financial assets of the County of Gray. When we look at the financial assets, you will notice that the largest variance in financial assets is the increase in cash and investments. There were additional funds allocated from the bank accounts um, to investments during the year, as well as investment of funds held in reserve for future purposes. When we look at the liabilities, for the corporation. Um, you will note that there has been an increase in amounts um, for accounts payable. Um, there has been an increase in amounts due to the province for um, social, mostly due to social services programs where funds were not expended and are due back to the province at the end of the year. When we look at deferred revenues, um, there is more detail on page 27 for those who wish to um, look at that directly. But um, the largest uh, changes in the deferred revenue classification um, relate to developers charges that were collected and not expended during the year. So these will be amounts that will be utilized into the future. The middle of the page here is the net financial assets. Um, the increase in net financial assets is a positive variance supporting the ability of the municipality to meet its financial obligations and have um, ready funds available for the future. When we look at the non-financial assets, there is an increase of over $5 million in the tangible capital assets, um, showing the investment by the county in the physical infrastructure and assets of the municipality in excess of any recognition of amortization as expense during the year. The overall accumulated surplus did increase by over $16 million, um, which again is a positive variance um, showing the increased um, investment in the municipality and also um, the accumulation of surplus for and reserves, um, sorry, for um, future projects um, that are planned. The next page is the uh, statement of operations and accumulated surplus. And I'm going to highlight a couple items on this page as well. When we look at the revenues in comparison to actuals and budget for the 2020 year, there is a note that the revenues are higher than budget. When we look deeper down into the functional areas, so by department, it is noted that there are several areas where grants were not recognized or grants were not um, completed due to COVID restrictions during 2020, but there were additional funds received for COVID revenues as well. So that's uh, counterbalancing um, the grant revenues um, year over year. 
when we look at the expenses, um, the expenses are showing as $11 million greater than what was budgeted. But one of the items that is not shown in the budget at this time is the budget for amortization of the capital assets on an annual basis. The amortization um, year for the 2020 year end was also approximately $11 million. And we can actually go through that in a little bit more detail when I get to the blue report and show you how um, on a departmental basis, the expenses were actually lower than budget when you remove the um, consideration of amortization. The annual surplus for the year is showing as $16 million, but I would like to point out that this is prior to the purchase of any of the capital assets um, that were done during the year, any reserve transfers or any debt repayment, which are balance sheet items and are shown separately. Um, I can also um, go through that um, difference when we get to the blue report. So that is the high level overview of a few of the pages of the financial statements. And maybe I will take a moment now before I switch reports to ask if there are any questions at this time. Sorry, thank you very much for that. And perhaps before we do even that, I should put this item on the floor. So uh, it is uh, uh, moved by Councillor uh, Desai and seconded by Councillor Carlton that the financial statements for the year ending December 31st be received and the treasurer be authorized to approve and sign the financial statements. Uh, so that might allow us to have <laughs> questions and discussion. Before you move into the other part of the report, you wanted to entertain questions now? Yeah, I thought that just before I switched over, that might be appropriate if that's okay with yourself, Warden. Madam Clerk. Councillor Millen and Councillor Desai. Thank you. Councillor Mellon. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, uh, good morning, Victoria and Tracy. Um, I note in the on your the final page there that you were just going through uh, on under expenses, long term care. Uh, uh, the actual is some five million dollars over budget. And I presume a lot of that was to do with the pandemic. Is there an offsetting um, increase in funding from the province? that uh, balances that over budget number? There definitely is an increase in grants during the year. Um, and as I mentioned um, just previously that there were other projects for grants that were budgeted that were not undertaken, um, that were anticipated during the 2020 budget process. And those were replaced with the actuals from the COVID funding um, as well during the year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Desai. Thank you, uh, Warden. It's my question is with regards to the um, the the error that was found, um, and it's not not specifically regarding the error. It's more to do with the issuance of the between audit. What is the consequence of the the municipality or the county not receiving uh, a clean audit? Uh, this is more more for my my curiosity. The, 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 um, the county did actually still receive a clean audit. Um, so, so when we give an audit opinion, our audit opinion is if the, if the financial statements are, are, are not materially misstated and the, um, the um, unadjusted difference was well below materiality. Um, so, so you do still have a clean opinion that the financial statements are um, it, um, in all material respects in accordance with the with with the counting standards. So Warden Hicks, if I may uh, provide some clarity on my question, I, I do recognize that we have received a clean audit. Um, my question was what what would be the consequence if we didn't? Uh, it's, it's a hypothetical. Uh, I do recognize that we have received a clean audit. So, so what would the consequences be if you didn't get a clean opinion? Correct. Um, so I, uh, I can take it if you want, Tracy. Okay. Yeah, it would be my expectation in, um, that our auditors um, would provide a, a letter back to the treasurer and to myself um, that outlined uh, what the, their findings were, what the issues were. Um, and that there would be a requirement um, for Mary Lou and myself to uh, 
take whatever remedial action was required to adjust that, but that is information that would come back to council. Like the, any, any letter from our auditor would be shared um, that had any findings and it would be shared with county council. So you were aware both of the issue, but also what action was being taken to address that issue. Is that fair, Tracy? Yep, for sure. Thank you so much. That's it, Council Desai? Yes, it is. Thank you. Next, I have Council Potter. Thank you. Uh, maybe I, I shouldn't uh, look a gift horse in the mouth, but I just was looking at the social services numbers, and we seem to be $5 million under budget. Uh, now, maybe there's good news in that, but maybe not. I just couldn't make up my mind how to... How to uh, put that in context. So perhaps you could help explain it to me. So this is going to be one of the areas where the grant funding was not recognized. So there were cash flows during the year um, in relation to the social services program. And due to things like daycares not being open at the same capacity during the year and changing uh, the funding types, um, there were some amounts that were not expended and therefore the expenditures are going to be lower. And then also the grant recognition is going to be lower um, for those functional areas as well. So though there are reductions in the expenditures, there are related reductions of normal operating funding um, through social services that the grants are not being recognized at the same time. So likely to be just a one-time uh, situation then? Possibly 2021 as well, depending on um, how things are going this year. We are just opening up tomorrow um, after lockdown number three. So in terms of um, the results for 2021, I can't necessarily say that it's a one-time only um, situation, but we will, um, you'll probably hear some updates from the management team as to how things are going for 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Potter. Um, Madam Clerk, I do not see anyone else's hands. No, I don't either. Okay, so we'll turn it back over to you, uh, Vicki and Tracy. I don't know what, which one is gonna proceed. That would be me again, sir. Thank you very much. Um, so now we're going to go to the blue, what we call the blue report, which is a graphical representation of key financial um, indicators um, for the County of Gray. So I'm going to um, scroll down to page three um, of this report, which shows a, there's a brief um, overview five year comparison of the increase in the net financial assets over the last three years, um, just for your um, review. But then also the composition of accumulated surplus is shown in the bottom right hand side. So that $256 million, which is shown on the main balance sheet of the financial statement is comprised of the amounts that are invested in your tangible capital assets, amounts that are to be funded in the future for unexpended capital, um, the amounts that are internally debentured, and also any external liabilities coming to the net investment in capital assets of just over $200 million. Also part of the um, accumulated surplus is amounts that are going to be funded in the future um, as transactions occur for post-employment benefits, uh, a prior commitment to Gray Bruce Health Services um, was there in the past. We have, there is a continued commitment to Georgian College and then other surplus amounts. And that comes under 193 million. And then the reserves for future and future projects of $63 million to get to the $256 million, which is shown on your um, statement of financial position. We have a graphical breakdown of the cash flow changes during the year for your information. And we also include some information on page five of this part of the package, which shows um, the capital assets by type, um, which are at net book value. So after amortization has been recognized in comparison to the historical cost um, as those assets were purchased um, in the past. And then the composition in graphical form as well. 
One of the next areas is going to be that comparison of revenues. Um, this is done on a um, high level area overview. So it's not by those departmental areas, which may have answered your questions a bit more succinctly, Councillor Potter. Um, but um, it is showing that overall, um, much of the funding for the County of Grey for 2020 was from government transfers. And then the remainder from um, the next one is from taxation, the next highest out level. When we go to page seven, um, this is the section that I alluded to previously, which um, goes on more of a departmental basis um, to look at the expenses in comparison to prior year and in comparison to budget. So if we exclude the amortization, which is not part of the taxation budget that is approved by council on an annual basis, the budget was just under $122 million. When we look at the actuals, it was just um, 121,250,000 um, is really where the expenditures came out after overall. So there are some areas um, as pointed out in terms of long-term care, um, the needing for additional staffing and costs um, to support the residents in those homes. Um, and then you're also going to see um, paramedic services again, performing so many different services in the community that um, as frontline workers is very much appreciated um, um, and other different areas. But um, overall the budget, when you look on an operating basis was actually less than what was originally approved by council. Um, just to go to the next page, we see this in a bit more of a graphical sense. Um, and in this, in this way, we can see long-term care had the overall, the 27% of overall expenditures, um, followed by social housing, social services, and paramedic services um, as the highest um, areas of expense by functional area. And these are all areas that are supporting the community and supporting the residents of um, the County of Gray directly. When we look at um, the expenses by object, so what are the types of costs? 51% of those expenses are the salaries. So those are the people actually providing all those services to the residents of the County of Gray. The last page, um, the last two pages, or actually three, I guess. So this, um, sorry, I should clarify um, the departmental summary of surplus transfer to reserve. Um, this should be familiar information. This is a report that um, was provided by management for inclusion in this report, um, showing the transfers of surplus at the end of the year by functional area. And then the last two pages um, advise what are the amounts that are held um, for the future for reserves and reserve funds. So when we look at this page here, what is there for the future in terms of reserves? It shows the increase of just over $11 million in reserves. So the $63 million, um, the bulk of that is for future capital purposes, setting monies aside now and in coming years for future projects um, as they come about in accordance with your cap asset management plans. The next page or the last page of our report here is going to be what the funds you have for the future for obligatory reserve funds. So this is where the development charges and the federal gas taxes are um, held. Again, showing that increase in development charges year over year as amounts are being set aside for those projects that are gonna be funded by those DC amounts in the future. Um, a small decrease in the federal gas tax as some projects were able to be uh, completed during the year. So that is our um, blue report. Um, again, I would like to um, echo Tracy's comments about um, the thanks um, that we would like to provide all the management of um, the County of Gray who have contributed to our audit. And also thank you again to council this morning for having Tracy and I here to present. Thank you very much, uh, Vicki, and thank you, Tracy, as well. I'll turn things over to council now for <clears throat> any questions. Again, I'm not seeing my top row, so I'm assuming Councillor Milne, you've got a question. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Warden. And uh, not a question per se, uh, just an observation. It's interesting to note uh, under the operating expenses by function, uh, the health unit, um, uh, used simply 1% of our entire budget, which is juxtaposed beside the outsized impact 
the, the positive impact that they had on the lives of all of our citizens in Grey Bruce for the last, last uh, 15 months or whatever it was or whatever it has been. Um, I think that uh, demonstrates a very good value, very good uh, investment of our funds there. And uh, I just uh, thought that was rather interesting to note. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Milne. Anyone else? Um, Mary Lou. Mary Lou. Go right ahead. Thank you, Mr. Warden. I would just like to say thank you to Tracy, Vicki, and their team. Um, it's been, like I, they said, it's a challenging year to, uh, to audit. We uh, moved everything to an online portal last year. Um, Kevin drove 17 three-inch binders down to their office that were quarantined for three days before they could use them. And as we had things ready this year, everything was uploaded to a portal. So um, it's worked well. Staff embraced it. And I'd also, in addition to Vicki, Tracy, and the team at BDO, just like to thank our team here. Um, it was another challenging year. Um, we were almost finished the working papers in March 2020 when we went into lockdown. This year was a little different. And um, everybody has worked really well together, and I'm really proud of them. And I'm also, I'd like to say thank you to the departments that we've worked with. Um, it's, it's a challenge, you know, working with people, asking questions, doing things through teams. And everybody's been so cooperative and patient with us. And just thank you to everyone. Yes, thank you for those words, uh, Mary Lou. And thank you as well to Vicki and Tracy. I think it's time to call the question on the motion. Is there anyone opposed? And seeing none, that is carried. So once again, thank you, Vicki. Thank you, Tracy. Thank Bravo. you very much. A lot Thanks of work. for having us. Cheers now. Okay, so we now are gonna be turning to our delegations. Um, and I wonder if I could just canvas our delegates if they are present. Uh, and, and I'm wondering uh, if we would be putting anyone out terribly if we took, say, a 10 minute break. Uh, so our delegates uh, here and just speak right up. Uh, I'm hopeful that we can take a 10 minute break. Um, Center Gray Health Services Foundation. I'm yes, fine with the break. Fine with the break. All right. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate that. We've been sitting for just over an hour and I like to get, get, get us to get up and move around a little bit. So if we can, it's now 10, I'm going to call it 1040. Uh, so if we can come back at 1050. So 10 minutes before 11 sharp. We'll see you all then. Turn off your cameras and your microphones, please. Thank you. 
All right, so we're about five seconds and counting. Are we going to be going live? We are continued live and, and recording. Excellent. It looks like we do have a quorum, so I want to welcome everyone uh, back. We are now on to our delegations. I'm going to be welcoming from Great Bruce Health Services, Gary Sims um, and John Kervik. Kervin Kervik. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> uh, yes, you now have the floor. Please go right ahead. And we do have your uh, presentation as well. And for viewers watching, it is on the website uh, along with the materials for this meeting. Thank you, Ward Nix and members of council for allowing us to meet with you today and present. Um, it's nice to be able to present on this subject to you, uh, given the year we faced and the year that we're still facing, uh, this is some good news to share and, and we're happy to have the conversation with you. Uh, I'll start out just by saying uh, what a pleasure it is to be working with the um, foundation on this project and to be the leader who's been fortunate enough after so many years to bring this to, to a start of the build and to see shovels in the ground and the concrete being poured. Um, in amongst all the other things that have happened this year, this is a bit of a bright star. So happy to meet with you all today. And I'm going to pass it over to John and John will walk you through the slides and then we're happy to answer any questions you might have. John. Good morning, uh, Warden and uh, Council. Uh, happy to present this. So I'll go through the slides uh, pretty quickly. And as Gary said, uh, we'll uh, do the questions afterwards. So starting off with the history, Really, the slide, uh, all I'd like to say is you can see this has been a, uh, an over 20 year exercise that uh, the organization and community has gone through to uh, get this hospital. And as you go through the different timelines, you can see it's taken that long. It's gone through uh, several different um, government uh, iterations. And, uh, and yet here we are uh, in 2021, March 1st, uh, construction has started for the next slide. However, we should say that MP Walker has been, MPP Walker has been with us throughout the journey and we couldn't have done it without him and he's great advocacy. So I just want to pop that in there, a little bit of advertisement. <laughs> so in terms of funding, uh, the project, the constructor, the general contractor is Bird Construction. Um, they've got a good history uh, with healthcare and are quite excited uh, and are looking at this project as really a, a capstone for their organization uh, in Ontario. The total project value is coming in around 69 million. Uh, in terms of how the funding works uh, of that, of the construction, 90% uh, is covered by government, 10% uh, the community has to uh, raise, but that is only the construction cost. So when you look at the furniture fixtures, all the equipment in this new hospital, 100% of that is coming from the community. And we couldn't do that without our foundation who's gonna be speaking to you uh, later on. Uh, and uh, thank you to uh, everyone for your support uh, and for Gray County. Uh, you gave us the land that we're building this hospital on, so we're uh, so appreciative of that. So the, the hospital, uh, to the next slide, with the uh, services, it's going to be a 68,000 square foot uh, facility, 24-7 uh, emergency room. Uh, third bullet there, just to highlight, that's a, a typo. There's actually uh, eight exam and treatment rooms uh, in this hospital. And so that's a much more robust emergency department than what you have in, in the current Markdell Hospital. But uh, rounding that out, we'll have uh, lots of outpatient services. You can see the diagnostic imaging, ambulatory care is all the clinics that can be uh, offered, as well as a lab, um, spiritual uh, space, uh, and the foundation will also be located there. And they designed the hospital with room on the ground floor that uh, can be looked at for future opportunities. So we've built it for the future for sure. For the next slide, the foundations have started in April. Um, they, be, uh, they should be completed by uh, August. As you can see from the site, the excavation's done, the sanitary sewers are in, the roadways are set. Uh, you know, the, the construction's proceeding uh, quite well um, thus uh, far. We hope to have the, the facility uh, open in 2023 uh, to the public 
And as you know, there's a snowmobile trail that we've relocated to the perimeter of the site and we're certainly uh, going to be engaging the users of that trail uh, you know, on, uh, on how to make it uh, you know, work well for the future. And it's an ATV one, apparently. I yeah. found out a couple weeks ago when I did the walk, <laughs> it's not only snowmobile, it is an ATV group too. So we're working with them as well. So some photographs of the uh, site and these were taken a couple of weeks ago show you different aspects of, uh, so you can see they're, uh, they're pouring a lot of concrete. Uh, that seems to be, uh, and it's funny when I asked for an update a few weeks ago, they actually had to stop for a day because of snow, which was an unusual occurrence when we had that snow day on the Friday. Just give me just one more. So a little bit about current hospital volumes, about 13,000 uh, visits in the ED. You can see lots of diagnostic imaging and lab procedures. 84% um, of our patients come from Gray County uh, into the hospital. We don't see anything other than uh, growth for this area. And it's certainly, you know, there's a lot of people migrating from the GTA uh, into Gray County. And, uh, and so uh, we think this hospital is gonna be quite uh, busy. Currently employ 90 staff, uh, two permanent physicians. Uh, we have locums that uh, cover the ED and, uh, and all indications are with a new modern facility with all this ambulatory care space, it's gonna really help uh, recruit uh, professionals uh, to the area and hopefully uh, in terms of economic development, it's going to uh, you know, spur additional economic development uh, for the county. In terms of how we communicate what's going on at the site, uh, you can see there's been a number of presentations. Uh, Chamber of Commerce has a TV screen set up. Uh, we'll be sending regular letters to the residents that surround where the construction's going on to keep them updated. Uh, as well, we post information uh, on our website and certainly using Gray Highlands What's Happening newsletter uh, to keep uh, all your constituents informed as we go through this process. And that is it. Thank you. Um. Well, thank you very much, uh, Gary and John, for that update. Very exciting. I was there for the, um, uh, the, the announcement by the Premier, as, as were you. Uh, Council, are there any questions of our delegates? Oh, that was easy. Nobody had questions. That. Come on, that's crazy. <laughs> Too much good news at once just oh, makes everybody stall. That's I, I do see Councillor Millen stand up. Oh, there you go. <laughs> just, uh, just one question. I couldn't let you off that easy. Um, I'm just wondering, in terms of uh, budgeting and valuing, you know, but uh, for uh, things going forward. Uh, what value do you place on that land that the county uh, presented to the uh, project in terms of dollars? 220, yeah. $220,000. But what value will that be on the books? Um, surely that property's worth more than that. Uh, I don't think we value yeah. it that way. Most yeah. of our properties eventually, because we own them for so long. I mean, I, I think we own uh, 12 different properties. Uh, other than residential properties, which carry those values, uh, even the old hospital, which has property of its own, uh, the value of that is often yeah. reassigned to another public entity for another use rather than sold. If we were a downtown Toronto hospital, I hear what you're saying, because I would be trying to sell that property at a later date or, uh, you know, transition that in some cases into dollars for other things. Uh, even the old hospital, which now sits on quite a large piece of property, we don't carry that with a lot of value. In other cost. words, sorry? It's at historical cost. Yeah, it's kept at historical cost. And, and, and really because we don't, as a not-for-profit, we, we, not that we wouldn't or couldn't do those things, you're right, uh, but we don't normally. We try to, in other words, if someone tried to buy the old hospital from me, I would look for and am looking for and, and have conversations already started with people that want to reuse it for a not-for-profit health purpose and it would be signed over for a dollar as long as it's done and in the right way with the right partner. 
So maybe it's not good business, but it's how hospitals kind of have always worked in rural areas. Unless you want to make a big offer on the old hospital. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was thinking the uh, the dollar uh, that you're uh, suggesting might be a little expensive for a little pricey for, for a legacy site like that. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Mill. I think you're probably, um, there's different values that are used, but I know you're probably referring to the tangible capital asset uh, value for depreciation purposes. I don't see you nodding your head. But. Well, uh, however you wanted to word it, um, I think that piece of ground is worth far more than 220,000, but I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? Uh, I think uh, Deputy Warden McQueen, have you got your hand up? And Councillor Desai. Excellent. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Mr. Warden. And, and thanks to our presenters. I should try to take my hand down when I'm done here. Um, I want to thank you, uh, Gary and staff, for all that you're doing and uh, continuing the, the vision of, of building that new hospital. That was exciting news earlier on this year and when the announcement came. I do also want to thank uh, your group with regards to working with the local Snowbill Club and the ATV Club. I know they were, I know they, uh, they reached out to me and, and I tried to connect them with uh, the right person and your staff. And I, I really want to thank you for reaching out to the community and, and, not only all the other great things you're doing and, and, and that, but just even sometimes the small things, uh, you know, like that do mean a lot to a lot of people. So I would just want to thank you for working with those groups. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Deputy Warden. Uh, Councillor Desai. Uh, thank you, Warden Hicks. So if, if, uh, if Southgate does in fact put in a big offer, uh, could we say that, that we're going to build a hospital in Markdale and make Southgate pay for it? Because I'm, I'm now I'm looking forward to the offer coming in. I didn't hear the question. What All right. That? Stop, Councillor Desai. You've been drinking. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else, Councillor Desai? No, I, I just want to thank the uh, the presenters, uh, and and I want to thank them for the uh, the ongoing uh, and very transparent, if I might add, communication that they've. Uh, uh, the channels that they've uh, maintained uh, they they had presented before grad and council as well uh, uh, very recently and so I'm, I'm I know people in the community are very excited to uh, to see the progress um, there there was at one point a number of naysayers who said well I'll see it when the shovels are in and you know now we're able to look at look over there and say well the shovels are in and you know there's a lot more than shovels that's going in now so I'm, I'm very happy to see this progress and I'm very excited for the future of Gray Highlands and Gray County. Thank you. We are too. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Desai. Madam Clerk, I do not see any other hands, correct? Correct. And with that said, then, I want to thank uh, uh, Gary and John for that update and that presentation. And I do have a few words. Uh, um, the words start with, I'm pleased to provide this check. I don't know if you can see it there. That's always good. I can't quite see it, but I'm doing my best, man of white here. <laughs> keep, it, keep it there for one more second. Mary Margaret's going to take a picture. <laughs> okay, let's see if we can get that. There, there we go. She's got it now. She's coming in. Okay. So I'm pleased one, to provide warning. this check for. Warning. Sorry. One more time, warning. Oh, okay. One more time. I'll get Mayor McQueen above you there. Really appreciate that. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much. So I have a couple of words. Uh, so I'm pleased to provide this check for $780,000 in fulfillment of Gray County's commitment to the Center Gray Hospital in Markdale. Today's amount combined with the value of the land uh, at 220,000 brings the total contribution to $1 million. These <laughs> funds have been set aside in reserve fund anticipating this contribution since 2006. I'm delighted to see this project moving forward and the current Center Gray Hospital serves as an important rural uh, service hub and this new facility will help them continue to serve our community with modern equipment and room to grow. In February of this year, Ontario Premier Doug Ford uh, and Deputy Premier and Minister of Health Christine Elliott announced that the construction of the new hospital in Markdale had been approved and construction officially began in March. The hospital will take approximately two years to build and will cost close to $70 million. 
million dollars. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, thank you, folks. Great news. Thank you for that update. Yes, uh, lots of people happy with so uh, to see this proceeding. Have a good thank day. You. Thank you Mr. for having Mr. us, Mr. Warden. Mr. Warden. Yeah. Yes. One more one comment, if I may, before our guests leave. Um, the day of the announcement, we had an, an agenda, and through the um, the graciousness of our local MPP. We've had the premier sign it, the health minister sign it. Uh, I think the only one left is your signature, Mr. Warden. And then once that is done at a certain time, I want to be able to present that to the hospital for the archives from the announcement of that day. So just an FYI, when we get together, uh, I need your signature. Very good. But my signature will cost you a lot of money. It's pretty valuable now. $780,000. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Thank you again, Gary and John. Have a good Thank day. You. Thank Take you. Take care. Okay. And uh, next, uh, we have Central Gray Health Services Foundation. I believe that we have uh, Harvey Fraser and Bob Pringle. Um, Markdale Hospital donation and campaign update. Gentlemen, you have the floor. Well, first of all, um, we wish to thank Warden Hicks and the entire County Council for allowing us an opportunity to meet with you to talk about local health care. As mentioned, I am Harvey Fraser, Vice Chair of the Center Gray Health Services Foundation and Chair of the Together in Care campaign for the New Markdell Hospital. With me, I have Bob Pringle, a member of the Together in Care campaign, along with Darlene Lamberti, Executive Director of Center Gray Health Services Foundation. We have a very short and informal presentation for you today, and feel free to jump in at any time. So with that, I would ask the administrator to bring up the slide deck. I think Darlene is going to share her screen. Okay, are you with us on that, Darlene? Yep, she's just bringing it up. Okay. Okay. Is that as uh, the big as it gets there, Darlene, or can we expand that a bit? If not, that's fine. Um, if you look, this presentation, so first of all, I'm going to say is, is, is somewhat a little repetitive of what uh, John had presented. But there are points in here that uh, need repeating and uh, there's some information. First of all, this is a, a good picture of uh, artists of the new hospital and what it's going to look like. So, and there'll be some other slides from inside of uh, artists or of uh, pictures of it also. If you look at the history, very few hospitals have been built. So not only is it rare, it is quite remarkable that after fighting for 20 years, this community has finally succeeded. Our hospital finally broke ground in March, 2021 and expected to take approximately 18 months to build after an, another six months to move in. So with doors open in two, approximately two years or sometime in mid 2023. Uh, next slide, please. The new facility will be much more inviting for, pa for patients, visitors, and staff to work in. The building is far more efficient with larger spaces and better allocation of resources. It will modernize every aspect of the care that is presently provided in the current facility, plus it expands the ambulatory capabilities, which is key for a small community. This is important because many routine procedures that were once inpatient procedures are now done through ambulatory care. We're very proud of the fact that the ambulatory care space is the second largest in all six hospitals in the Gray Bruce Health Services Corporation, second only to Own Sound Hospital. Over the past several years, Markdale Hospital has lost services because it did not have sufficient ambulatory space. With the new facility, we anticipate reintroducing mobile scope programs, as well as bringing in specialty clinics. This means expanded services closer to home for Gray County residents. Next slide, please. 
Along with providing more healthcare options closer to home, the new facility will also help to attract and retain professionals to the region. The new facility will house state-of-the-art technology. This is imperative as technology is a predominant component in medical equipment and therefore medical care. When the technology is better, it makes the workplace more attractive to best trained professionals. When the dust settles, we expect that staffing numbers could very well increase. The building was designed with the ability to increase in size and bed numbers as population and demand increases. Next slide. Let's, let's uh, uh, you want the financial figures there, Darlene? Yeah, it's coming, my internet, I apologize. My internet is horrible here today. Okay. Should it be up now? No. It's not, not the right slide. There we go. Let's discuss the financial overview of our capital campaign. The figures on this slide are pretty self-explanatory. This is a 68 to $70 million project. And we have agreed to have available up to 12 and a half million for our share of the project. Of this, 7.8 has been collected from the first campaign to now. And as you've seen today, Gray County has generously donated and completed their, their pledge and fulfillment to date of the million dollars of land and donation. Two million has been committed from the local municipalities as well for a total of 9.8 million. This leaves a gap of 2.7 million, which we are now campaigning to raise within our communities. Next slide. We would like to take this opportunity to thank you for your patience and your support with this project over the past couple of decades. This has not been an easy road for any of us, and we appreciate that your residents have felt the need for a new hospital as much as anyone. We are pleased that this project is moving ahead at a very fast pace. And like I said, if you have any questions regarding this project, we encourage you to reach out to us and we will try and answer them. Uh, next slide, please. We have come today to you today to ask if you would consider increasing your original pledge by 15%. This would mean an additional amount of 150,000. This is equivalent to 1% per year, which may represent a small portion of the interest that would have been earned on your original pledge. This can be paid over a period of time 30,000 a year for the next five years or whatever is suitable to Gray County budget. Next slide, please. We are proud to be partnering with you on this project as we transform healthcare in Gray County for generations to come. We thank you for your time and consideration today. And that is the end of our presentation, so. If there's... Well, thank you very much, Harvey. And I know that you have uh, Bob and Darlene with you. Is there anything that uh, those two individuals wanted to add? No, I think yeah. Harvey's covered it. Yeah. Yeah. Bob, if you wanted to say anything there, but uh, I, I think we've, you know, we just wanted to bring this up to you guys and everyone and ladies that uh, um, we are in a campaign. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so I'll turn things over to council. Is there any questions from anyone on council? Councilor McQueen. Councilor McQueen. Well, thank you, Mr. Warden. And uh, thanks, Harvey, for doing the presentation along with Darlene doing her part as well. Harvey, are you able to explain a little bit? Um, and I know that originally when the campaign went out, I guess about 2003 or four, there was a um, uh, I think of 12, over $12 million had been committed, but that was back in 2003 and four when the campaign kicked off in that one year cycle. Uh, can you explain a little bit uh, why or what happened over that time where we do have that shortfall and, and maybe just, just to briefly speak to that because uh, obviously there was a commitment, but then as the hospital took a lot longer than was first uh, expected, the then that commitment may be changed. I don't know if you're able to speak to that at all. 
Yeah, it, it's it's pretty self uh, explanatory. The, the 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 campaign back 15 years ago, uh, there were pledges of 12 to 13 million dollars at that time. Uh, as we all know, the time frame kept getting stretched out and stretched out and stretched out, and people became somewhat hesitant to continue with their pledges. So a number of pledges were halted uh, in the mid process. On top of that, there were pledges made by people that uh, are no longer with us uh, and that, were, that uh, could not be honored uh, due to, to deaths in the, in the, in, of different people that have pledged. So overall, um, we have approximately 7.8 in the, in the count of, of money that has been collected. None of that money that has been collected, the capital, not a penny of it, has ever been spent. So that leaves us the shortfall of, of where we are today. And that's why we launched a campaign of 5.7, but that includes the county's pledge and commitment and all the local municipalities also in there. So the community campaign, when that all, when, if all those pledges come through as planned, will be approximately 2.7 million because there's with the county and the municipalities, that's approximately $3 million. So well, the shortfall is 2.7 if all pledges come in from the municipalities. Hope that explains. Thank you, Harvey. Uh, Deputy Warden, is anything yeah, else? Just, just to follow, and, and thanks Harvey for the explanation. And, and the one good news is, is the commitment that uh, the community uh, had to raise the 12 million never changed. So, so we're very fortunate that that stayed that same level is, is the campaign that was 15 plus years back. So again, um, we need to, we need to, to continue to follow up that shortfall. Um, one other thing, Harvey, I think you mentioned that our council that um, as time goes on, there's going to be draws happening with you know, as, as you move forward with our hospital uh, development, there's going to be certain draws on that commitment of, of 12 plus million. And I don't know if you want to speak to that or not, only from the part is that your, your, your full amount is going to start to be de depleted as you walk through this program or to yeah. the, through the program. Yeah, I can speak to that. And it's already being depleted. Um, there has been a, approximately $3 million sent to GBHS, Currently, uh, we are committed to 587.5 every quarter for the next two years. And then at the last, I believe it's 2.8 million after the hospital is completed. So like I say, the, the, the funding has started, the, the disbursements have already started to flow out at a, a fairly rapid pace. And uh, like I said, We've made one of our installments currently, uh, the first installment of the, of the quarterly. So we have uh, seven more of those to go, I guess would be the, where we are in the quarterly payments. So yeah, the funding, uh, it, 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 it's, it's flowing out quite rapidly, but uh, that's why we're in the process of launching a, a campaign here very shortly. So I just want to add that of that, um, $3 million has already been paid to GBHS. Yes. Thank you, darling. Councillor Milne, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Warden, and uh, good morning, uh, Harvey and, and uh, Darlene. Um, thank you for uh, your continued work on this. I, I think it's a, uh, it's a very important uh, job you're doing. <clears throat> and I dare say, if you're like me, you had a little more hair when this all started. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I'm actually uh, very supportive of, uh, of extending uh, more funding to this project as Harvey has, uh, has asked for. Uh, I know Southgate and other municipalities have had the same request and responded positively. Um, I'm just wondering, Madam Clerk, we have a committee... Um, I think it was dedicated or it was one of its tasks was to discuss how um, healthcare funding could be, uh, could be managed at, at the county level, uh, levels of funding and all the rest of it. I'm wondering, would it be appropriate to defer this, not defer, but to refer this ask to that committee 
uh, or would it just be a matter of uh, staff bringing a report back to council as a whole? How would uh, how would you see that handle? Or maybe the maybe Kim has a has an answer for that. Um, CAO. Certainly, um, I think that uh, with council's with council's direction, it, um, should someone wish to uh, make a resolution to the effect that that these funds be um, included in the in the 2022 budget for consideration that's a way forward we can certainly bring it back for further discussion um, at the uh, health care funding initiatives table i was as we've talked about here before thinking that our next meeting for that would be in september um, but again would come back through the 2022 budget so i think either one of those things could work Thank you. I would think, uh, Madam CAO, that uh, the committee might be the appropriate place because there, there will be more than just this request. And I think the, com um, the committee was trying to grapple with uh, a number of right. things. Yes, right. Yes. So it might be appropriate that it go to that uh, committee and then come back mm -hmm. um, with uh, a recommendation in the budget uh, process. And if we did that, Madam Clerk, uh, would we require a resolution to have the committee uh, look at this and, and then make a recommendation uh, for budget? That would be my recommendation that um, the request from the Centre Grey Hospital Foundation um, be referred to the uh, Healthcare Funding Initiatives Task Force for consideration in the 2022 budget. So okay. I will move what she just said. <laughs> I was going to say move by Councillor Desai. Um, that it be referred to the committee and come back uh, with a recommendation to budget. Uh, is there any discussion on that motion? I'll call the question uh, now. I do. Oh, yep. Sorry, Mr. Borden. I do see Councillor Sewever's hand up, so I'm not sure if he wants to speak to the motion or uh, just another comment or question. Right. And Councillor Sewever, I apologize for that. Go right ahead. Yeah, well, I, I was just wondering, uh, what is the status of the work of the committee? Um, it was quite some time ago that we, we discussed, um, you know, and we compared the percentage of funding in Simcoe to, uh, to Gray County and, and noted they were, they were a lot higher in terms of what they were contributing. But, and then we, we formed the committee and um, that was a long time ago. Um, so has the committee made any progress? Um, Madam uh, CEO, yes. I'm going to turn things uh, over to you. I, I guess the Thank short you. answer is yes, and we have met. But uh, yes, um, I think as as we most recently discussed, um, the work of the funding committee was um, set aside while we went through the whole COVID situation, thinking that. Um, there may be some new information and other considerations coming out of COVID and the things that our um, healthcare providers have learned from that. Where we had left things was we still had two interviews to complete. And um, those folks both know, one of whom is, is June Porter from your uh, community. Um, those presenters are anticipating coming before the community, the committee in September. And, um, We'll add this to the agenda as well, but that was the status of things. We really, when we stopped being able to meet in person um, and knew that many of those um, healthcare providers were very um, tied up with responding to the, the COVID crisis, um, we set this, this work aside for that time. Thank you, Councillor Soever. Is there anyone else, Madam Clerk? And if that's the case, then I think it's time to call the question. Is there anyone opposed to the motion that's been presented? Seeing no one, I will say that that is carried. Thank you very much. And I will say thank you to Harvey, Bob, and Darlene. Bob, you've been a, a quiet one. Strong, silent type, I gather. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, thank you so much for that update. And uh, I guess we'll be in touch. Well, thank you for uh, allowing us the time and your schedule to make this presentation. Um, it's it's been great and uh, a very positive uh, meeting. Thank you very, again very much. And thank you for the check presentation as well. Oh, yes. <laughs> thank you very, Vanna, very much. I, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So, Thanks a lot. Thanks, Thanks, Have a good day. Thank you.
So, oh. my internet seems to be going in and out. Can everyone hear me okay? Nod your head if you can hear me. Okay, yeah. good. Uh, we're on to item number four, looking at the consent uh, agenda. Is there anything that needs to be pulled, uh, Council? And if not, then we are going to go uh, with uh, the consent agenda is being moved by Councillor Compass and seconded by Councillor Mackey. Is there anyone opposed to that? That is carried. Thank you very much. Okay, we're on to item number 6A, scrolling down here. Mr. Wharton, I will note that Councillor Keaveny is leaving her chair due to her earlier declaration of interest. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Uh, so we are dealing with item 6A, the Hilton Head Heights, uh, Hilton Head Heights Condominium uh, Project. Uh, Stephanie Lacey Avon is on deck. It is being moved by Councillor Carlton and seconded by Councillor Patterson. Stephanie, you have the floor. Okay, Mr. Warden and County Council, um, the presentation is visible by everyone? Perfect. Okay, so before us, we have the final report for Hilton Head Heights, um, the alliteration that we all struggle with. It's a condominium located in Meaford at 408 Ridge Road. Here's an aerial image of the subject lands. The development will be situated on the north end of the site. So just up here. Um, while the remaining lands will continue to operate as the Meaford Golf Course. So it's currently and continuing to be a two nine hole course. The golf course has changed three fairways over the past six years to accommodate track rerouting for safety concerns. A golf spray analysis was completed for this project. There are residential detached dwellings and forested lands to the north up here, residential detached dwellings and vacant lands to the east here, and residential detached dwellings to the south down here. And this is the boundary of the settlement area. So to the west, there's agricultural lands. There will be new private road construction, which will be required to serve the proposed development from Ridge Road. So it will come off of here and enter the development. Servicing to the new condominium will be via full municipal water and sewer services. Here's the proposed draft plan. It's to create a total of 33 single detached lots. An additional 18 units are intended to form part of the separate condominium application, so along here. Um, and that will be extending northwest along the private road. This is intended to be submitted for processing at a later point once the updated EIS is completed, which is anticipated this fall. So this will be a vacant land condo, meaning units do not need to be constructed at the time the condo is registered. Because vacant land condos cannot be phased, there will be two separate condo corporations following development completion, sharing common elements, such as the roadway, the easements. Several, several technical reports have been submitted with the application, posted on the website, and were circulated to various agencies for review and comment, including plan justification report, environmental impact study, stage one and two archaeological assessment, traffic study comment, servicing report, stormwater report, plans and drawings. The proposed development also required a zoning bylaw amendment to the local municipal zoning bylaw. A holding symbol was applied to all lots through this process, requiring execution of a development agreement prior to removal. Further, this will confirm the avail availability of servicing, servicing capacity prior to any phase proceeding. The Republic comments received, the virtual public meeting was held March 15th, 2021. No members of the public attended. 
Comments received in writing with respect to this application include concerns with errant golf balls, um, the concerns regarding the loss of green space should the golf course be further developed, seeking future, future development plans of the entire golf course. Some of these matters were discussed at the municipal level. Um, because this, this land is currently privately owned, um, it, isn't, it extends beyond the, the development to provide further details of what their intentions and plans are of the golf course. Um, so at this point, we can affirm that the golf course will remain, will remain as a two nine hole course, um, but it is within the settlement area and it will have access to full municipal services. So at, at a point in time, it could become further developed for residential purposes. There were concerns regarding potential environmental impacts. So the quality and quantity of water entering Keats Creek and erosion of slopes. Um, further review was conducted by Grace Solville Conservation Authority and they had extensive correspondence with the applicant's engineer. And so those issues were resolved. Um, there are concerns regarding process for the subject file. In this case, there wasn't, there were two separate processes um, and, and it is certainly the county's best practice and we, we it aim to ensure best efforts so that joint public meetings are held just to avoid confusion. Um, there were concerns with truck traffic, so the half loads versus full loads, as well as tree cutting. The subject lands um, don't have identified significant woodlands, so there will be limited tree cutting to accommodate this proposal. Um, as well, traffic volume and speeding along Pearson Street and Ridge Road were identified as concerned, as well as provision of sidewalks. With respect to the agency comments received, um, Bell Canada was looking to ensure that through the development, there will be provision of communication and telecommunication infrastructure needed to service the development. East Link, there were no comments or concerns. Enbridge, no objection to the post development easements to be provided to service the development at no cost. Free Solid Conservation Authority, there were initial concerns with flooding and erosion hazards associated with Pete's Creek. Again, there was extensive correspondence and communication with the proponents engineer to resolve those issues. Um, at this stage, Grace Solvel Conservation Authority has issued a permit for installation of services and site alterations related to the entrance, related to entrance of stormwater facilities and servicing. Hydro One, there are no comments or concerns. And the municipality of Meaford passed associated zoning bylaw amendment. Municipal Council supported the recommended conditions of draft approval on April 12th. So an extensive and detailed analysis of parental county and municipal policy has been completed. The proposed plan of condominium is within the primary settlement area of the town of Meaford. Under Meaford's official plan, these lands are also designated major recreation. Through that designation, there our residential development policies included under this major recreation designation for the subject site. Full municipal services will be extended to the subject development and EIS was completed and GSCA has issued a permit for development and site alteration. Staff are of the opinion that the post development has regard for matters of the provincial, um, the planning act is consistent with the PPS, conforms with the county OP and conforms with the municipality of Meaford OP. Staff are recommending at this time that the subject, subject report we received that all written and oral submissions received on the site plan of condo were considered and the effect of which helped to inform recommendations and decisions and that the Gray County Committee of the Whole approves the plan of condominium subject to the conditions set out in the notice of decision. That concludes my presentation and I'd be happy to answer any questions or provide any clarification where needed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephanie. I'll turn to council now. If I could see the full screen again. Excellent. Councilor Milne, do you have a question? Yes, I did, Mr. Warden. Go right ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you for the report, Stephanie. Um, I, I, I can't help but think when I'm looking at the, uh, the proposed uh, development map uh, or diagram or whatever you want to call it here, that the road and the development area seems to be rather randomly just kind of drove across the, the property. Um, uh, waste of 
waste of land kind of comes to mind. Uh, is the intent for the golf course to work around this development or just up to it or, or how is that going to work? Or is there challenges on the ground that it has to be this way? I mean, I, I'm not familiar with the ground, of course, but it just looks rather wasteful in terms of land use. Hear you, Mr. Warden. Um, I can share my screen. There's additional mapping that may help provide just provide further context. There are significant hazard lands associated to the north of that where the proposed development is situated. Um, so that is why and such that the, the lands have been delineated as, as such. So that no development is being proposed within the hazard land. So I agree at face value, it does look a bit strange without seeing that under layer of the hazard lands, but that's the, the reason as to why it's designed as such. Okie dokie, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Milne. I don't see anyone else's uh, hands. <clears throat> and if that's the case, then maybe it's time to call the question. So is there anyone opposed to the, <clears throat> to the motion presented? I see no hands and therefore I will say that that is carried. I guess we'll invite Councillor Kiveny to come back to the meeting. Yes, I've just notified her the vote and the discussion is now complete. Okay. There she is. Welcome back, Councillor Keveney. We are moving on now to uh, item 6B, which is dealing with the development charges uh, appeal, appeal hearing process. Uh, it is moved by Councillor Mackey and seconded by Councillor Keveney. Um, our clerk and solicitor are going to be making this presentation. I was on mute, okay. Um, I'm going to start the presentation and then um, Mr. Laterno will step in and, and between the two of us will certainly answer any of council's questions because it's a first. Um, we have received our first appeal under the county's development uh, charges bylaws um, since the bylaws were enacted in 2007. The Development Act requires council to hold a formal hearing into the complaint and the hearing must be held under the rules provided in the Statutory Powers and Procedures Act. Section two of the county's procedural bylaw allows for council to hold a hearing under this act with the rest of the provisions of our procedural bylaw not being in effect. Um, since it's our first appeal uh, on development charges, there's no established processes on how to handle an appeal of this kind with the county. Um, and it is substantially different than a regular council or committee meeting. Staff are recommending a three person ad hoc hearing committee be established for the purposes of hearing the appeal. Those members on the hearing committee would serve as a partial impartial adjudicators and judges of the complaint. It is also recommended that the warden be one of those three committee members and act as the chair of that committee. A three person committee is very common in other tribunal settings. It is recommended that this committee be granted full power to hear the appeal and render a decision on the appeal. Uh, you will be familiar with the, um, the LPAT or the Local Planning Appeals Tribunal. This is very similar in format. It's also recommended that since the appeal is regarding a property in Georgian Bluffs, that our two council members representing Georgian Bluffs not be considered as a member on the hearing committee to avoid any perceptions regarding impartiality. The Development Charges Act contains some very tight timelines with the hearing required to be held within 60 days of receipt of the appeal. And I can confirm that I received the appeal as the clerk on May 10th. Uh, legal services staff and uh, my staff and my department um, will assist the committee, the hearing committee with the processes and the procedural matters related to the appeal hearing. Other county staff such as planning, finance and our CAO will assist in other areas around the role of the county with respect to the appeal. Both of these streams will operate independently, independently of each other to avoid any illusion of conflict. Uh, it's our recommendation that the committee not be an ongoing committee as it's unlikely given the history to date that many appeals will be received 
regarding development charges and the municipality subject to the appeal could change each time. However, if Committee of the Whole endorses the recommendation put forward by staff, this process will assist staff and council in the future should we have another appeal. Um, if the recommendations are supported ahead of council approval, uh, clerks and legal staff will work with committee members to begin the preliminary process as required to establish a hearing committee um, and establish the, the appeal hearing, including notifying the appellant. Um, in the email that was sent out with the council package, uh, it was requested any council members interested in putting their names forward were to let me know. I have received um, requests from councillors Woodbury and Desai. They've indicated their wish to be considered for an appointment to this hearing committee. That is all I have, Mr. Warden, but between uh, Mr. Letourneau and I, we would be happy to answer any questions. Mr. Letourneau, is there anything that you wanted to add before I turn it over for questions? Uh, thank you, Warden County Council. Not at this time, Heather's done an excellent job of covering the, um, the basics. Thank you. Perhaps I could start. Uh, I have just a really quick question. Uh, Mr. Letourneau, the, uh, the SPPA, does it require that the decision be rendered in writing? Yes. Uh, okay. Written decision is required and reasons, written reasons for decision, I believe, are on request. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Council, any questions? Uh, Councillor Soever, I believe you may have your hand up. Uh, you're muted. Uh, yeah, sorry, I keep forgetting I mute myself. Okay. Um, yes, um, my question is, uh, recently the province enacted the uh, Ontario Land Tribunal Act. Now, I believe there's a section of that act. I don't have it in front of me here, but there's a section which refers to the fact that its rules take precedence over the Statutory Powers Act. Uh, how, how are those? Um, yeah, okay, here it is. Despite Section 32 of the Statutory Powers Procedures Act, this act, the regulations and rules prevail over any provisions of that act with which they conflict. So is there, are there some changes we should be aware of um, that are, as a result of this new Ontario Land Tribunal Act being proclaimed? Mr. Warden, if I may. Um, that, uh, it's a good question. The uh, Ontario Land Tribunal Act reorganizes LPAT and several other tribunals into a single tribunal body. That act is what we call the enabling legislation for that, and it governs how the land tribunal will operate. The Statutory Powers Procedures Act is uh, a default uh, piece of legislation to fill in the gaps where a tribunal's enabling legislation doesn't give them uh, rules. So in this case, the Development Charges Act requires that council uh, hear the appeal and it doesn't provide any specific uh, procedural rules for the tribunal. So the Statutory Powers Procedure Act continues to apply to council's role under the Development Charges Act. The language in the Ontario Land Tribunal Act uh, dealing overriding the SPPA uh, only covers the tribunal's uh, rules and each of the tribunals that it uh, brought together have their own established rules. So really it just allows those tribunal rules to be melded together into the single new uh, unified body and leaves council in its tribunal capacity um, alone. So a uh, follow up, Mr. Warden? Oh, of course, go ahead. So in terms of uh, if, if there were people that wanted to be presenters, parties, participants, all of that, of course, there are no more presenters under the new Ontario Land Tribunal Act, but um, we, we would be governed by the, the Land Tribunal Act as far as um, the different categories of uh, people who might be involved. Uh, Mr. Warden, if I may, the, uh, no, we would be governed by the provisions under the SPPA and the common law that's applicable to tribunals. Uh, in that regard. So the only 
uh, party that has status in the hearing under the Development Charges Act is the uh, person the appeal to raise the, the, the act calls a complainant, uh, but it's the same essential idea. It's the person aggrieved. Um, the tribunal would either have to, of its own motion, include persons as, as parties or with other status, or would have to hear applications from anyone else who wanted uh, to be involved. Uh, any development charges complaint comes from a person required to pay a development charge. That's the, the trigger under the Development Charges Act. So they are by nature under the Development Charges Act quite specifically focused on uh, typically a development, anything that would trigger the payment of a DC uh, in the first place. So you're gonna find that they're arising from a very narrow set of uh, circumstances. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I do not see any other hands, Madam Clerk. I do not either, sir. Um, I should just mention that as, as I did get to um, interested counselors, um, as per our practice, um, I would like to ask counsel if there is anyone else who no. is interested in sitting on this uh, hearing committee. Right, I believe we have Woodbury and Desai for now. Correct. Anyone else interested? Is there a need, Mr. Warden, for any particular skills to sit on this committee? Uh, I, I will, turn I, I will to, resist. I will turn to, to, to Michael, but it, you are acting as a tribunal. So um, just to hear the appeal and, and render a decision on that appeal. I have full confidence in the two that have been, uh, have been nominated. I do see Councillor Robinson, Mr. Warden. I believe Mr. Letourneau was about to say something. Okay. Uh, only to say that to Councillor Milne's question for you, Mr. Warden, that the, the act empowers any municipal council. If a municipal council, upper tier, lower tier, single tier, enacts a development charges by law, that council serves uh, by default as the, uh, the hearing committee. So any, this is, those are the persons who are considered to be uh, able to provide, make the decision in this case. Um, so if you could be elected to the council, you could sit on the tribunal. That's the position under the statute, basically. And if I could follow that up, uh, given the nature of, uh, of this particular uh, tribunal, what would be the standard of review? Uh, that, Mr. Jordan, is a good question. Uh, standard of review having undergone recent uh, review under the Vavilov decision that came out a couple of years ago, um, it would go, the appeal, any appeal from the decision of counsel goes to uh, LPAT. So I think you would probably see them applying, or sorry, to OLT now, uh, it would see them probably applying a reasonableness uh, standard within their considerations. After that, um, probably reasonableness, but I couldn't say for sure without doing some research as to what a court would do with LPATS or uh, OLT's determination. Very good, thank you. I believe Councillor Robinson had a question. Yes, and thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Warden. So I do very much appreciate the, the detail written in the report and uh, the, uh, the presentation that we've just had. My question, is there merit in appointing an alternate to the hearing committee? Thank you. Madam Clerk. Um, we will, because it's a three person committee, it is um, going to be, I think, um, quite easy to bring those three together. We will work with both or all three of the council members to make that time um, available to them. So I'm not sure at this point um, that an alternate is required. Um, Michael, do you have anything further? Only that the SPPA uh, is meant to facilitate expedient decisions that are to be made and its terms are meant to be applied flexibly so that you can get everybody to the table for the hearing to be held and a decision to be rendered. Because of that, there's a lot of flexibility in how the tribunal can operate. It's a little 
different if you take the sort of polar opposite to it, you take a court proceeding where you have much more fixed rigid rules and timelines. And if you have to replace a judge, that can take weeks or months to reschedule a hearing if there's a, a conflict of interest, for example, that has arisen. So I think with the flexibility that the SPPA provides and the relatively small number of people as having notes on the, the proposed committee, um, I expect that this, we would be able to proceed without an alternate and not have any major road bumps. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Warden, just before you go to the vote, I just want to confirm um, after there's no other questions that the mover and seconder are, are fine with us, um, including Councillor Woodbury and Councillor Desai in the um, motion. I wonder if they might uh, each confirm. Mr. Warden, it's uh, Councillor Mackey. I certainly am uh, content with the uh, two individuals that put their name forward. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Councillor Woodbury. Now, let's start with Councillor Woodbury. Are you confirming your willingness? Yes, I am. And Councillor Desai? Uh, yes, I am. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, is it time for me to call the question? I think yes, okay. All right, so is there anyone opposed uh, to the motion that's been presented? So to receive this report and the recommendations contained therein, including uh, that Hicks, Woodbury and Desai shall form the members of this uh, tribunal. I see no one opposed. So I'm gonna say that that is carried. Okay, we have one item uh, uh, left and we've been sitting for just over an hour. Um, what is your wish, Council? We can take a short break and come back and finish, or uh, if you prefer to press on, uh, we can do that as well. I see more heads nodding for press on <laughs> than I see for taking the break. All right, so we'll move on then. So we're on item 6C. Uh, well, let me get back over here. <clears throat> and this is the Community Safety and Wellbeing uh, Planning. Uh, municipal agreement update. Uh, Barb Feedy is on deck to present this. It's moved by Councillor Patterson and seconded by Councillor Mackey. Barb, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Good morning, Council. Um, I'm here just to give you an update on where we're at with our community safety and well-being planning um, that we're jointly working with our neighbours in Bruce County um, for. Um, and today I'm looking for um, approval um, to receive the report um, that the new agreement between the County of Grey and the Corporation of the County of Bruce and the 16 participating lower tier municipalities be endorsed and that the warden and clerk be authorized to execute the agreement and further that I as the director would be reappointed as the County of Grey's representative at the Community Safety and Wellbeing Advisory Committee as well as at the Steering Committee. Okay, so uh, just for a little bit of background, um, we've been at this now since uh, 2019. Kim brought a report to council in 2019 and we moved forward with it. And then I brought a report back um, 18 months ago uh, with the uh, agreement at the time. And since that time, um, there's been some changes. And uh, that agreement was about forming the committee, moving community safety and well being um, forward, and uh, addressing the legislative requirement that all municipalities in the province had to, um, to augment this particular initiative. And so um, at the time we decided that we would move ahead um, together uh, and we have since had quite a bit of work take place. Um, we, are, we were prepared to meet the original deadline, which was January 1st of 2021, but it has been extended due to COVID. And so this has given us a little bit more time as well um, to meet the deadline of July 1st now um, with additional work that we have completed. And uh, the new agreement then speaks to the second phase. The first agreement spoke to um, moving community safety and well-being, um, uh, developing a plan and adopting the plan. And we're into the second phase, which is implementation. Part of that implementation was to develop an indicator report, gathering all the data points that we have. And I'm excited that we'll, we have a press release that will be launched, I think by the end of this week um, or early next week to share the indicator report. It is attached to this doc, to this report though. And uh, it is something that we want to share out widely with our part partners 
um, in municipalities as well as agencies and organizations, school boards. There are a lot, there's so much data that we have that we don't need to know the person to go and get it now. It's, it's contained within the report and it's a good starting place. Um, if anyone's writing grants, if anyone's looking for information about who we are in this region of, of Gray County and Bruce County. The information um, that we are looking for to share today, though, are the updates that have taken place since I last reported. And that was the approval of the plan and that it was presented as well. So we had um, completed a bit of a roadshow around to the municipalities. And um, we also attended uh, since since the last report, um, the, the public, uh, bo the Board of Health uh, meeting. We have presented at the police services boards and we have had a new um, coordinator, uh, our last coordinator, previous coordinator that got us off the ground. Sarah Cowley has moved on to be the executive director at the Y for Gray and Bruce, and uh, we have a new coordinator, Tanya Roberts. So there was some onboarding, recruitment and onboarding. Um, we have assumed oversight of the situation table. Something new for you to know. Um, we have had an ongoing, I would say six to seven years now of a situation table, which uh, addresses acute risk. It brings together partnerships, people that belong to organizations to have conversations that are non-identifying to ensure that uh, that um, solutions are found before we have to go upstream and, and, and move into something more drastic with someone. There's a lot of opportunity to engage and provide support before we get to a point where we must intervene with the police intervention. So at this table, um, the community safety and well-being table and the situation table were both initiatives under the Ministry of Solicitor General. And it made sense to bring on board the situation table as an action table of community safety and well-being. So we petitioned the advisory committee, all 72 plus organizations. We worked with uh, the folks at the previous situation table to honor and respect the work they've done to carry this forward. We were a little bit concerned as to what can happen when leaders are um, retiring or moving on and sometimes you lose the momentum and the strength of the partnerships. Having this embedded right within the community safety and well-being uh, framework will ensure that it's sustainable and that it continues on when other people leave. Um, and so we completed our round two of our engagement survey. We're currently reviewing the results. Um, I, there weren't as many that responded and I think it's a bit of COVID fatigue, a um, little bit of people are just tired, um, but we're, we're garnering some good information and data out of that and we'll be sharing that. And then we're working on an action table assessment tool. We know we have a lot of engagement tables here in Gray and Bruce, and we are going to be delegating some of the work that community safety and well-being identifies as priority risk to those tables. They're already there, they're working, they know each other, they're partners, and they can actually, uh, they, they're waiting to be given some instruction and some supports as to how to manage and what to do next to be able to make an improvement on people's lives and, and well-being. And then um, again, that indicator report I spoke to, and finally the municipal agreement has been updated and shared amongst the 16 municipalities involved in the two counties and we're moving forward to meet the deadline for July 1st to have all of our required documentation forwarded to the Ministry of Solicitor General. Is there any question or comments? Council, uh, I think uh, Councillor Potter, you're first. Uh, thank you, Warden. Um, I, I don't see anything that tells me how the funding will be managed on an ongoing basis. Uh, it talks about what we have done. It doesn't tell me what uh, so are we going to continue to uh, use our model where uh, we bill everybody according to their share of the, the county budget or Bruce's model where everybody pays the same amount? Through you, Mr. Warden. Thank you for the question, Councillor. That's a great question. We are really hoping and um, we're working with our parties to indicate to the ministry that as this is a mandated program, that there should be some funding that comes with it. We are um, Our funding right now does only take us through to the end of 2021. And we, part of our um, upcoming agenda at the advisory committee is to work through some solutions to that funding question that you're asking. We're all asking the same question. So I hope to come back with some information, but I wanted to reassure you that we don't don't have a solution, but it is on our table for discussion. Thank you. And secondly, uh, we do have uh, sort of regional situations, especially around our boundaries. Yeah. Obviously, the boundary with Bruce doesn't matter very much, but some of the other 
uh, you know, moving beyond that. So, for example, for us, a uh, sizable part of our municipality, uh, which contributes a great amount to the county uh, budget, uh, is represented by hospitals and healthcare and so on in, in Collingwood and in Simcoe County. So uh, we would want to make sure that they're represented in the decision-making process. And I, I know you're well aware of that. So I just wondered if, if there's a provision being made for that. Um, sure, through you, Mr. Warden. Um, we are uh, engaged with the situa uh, well, sorry, situation table, I'm getting my acronyms mixed up, with the uh, community safety and well-being tables from all of the surrounding um, regions. So we have had a, a couple meetings actually with our folks, our neighbors over in Simcoe, um, we've also met with uh, folks that are south of us in um, the Dufferin region. Um, we are connecting with people in Huron. So there's definitely an intention for us to be able to ensure that we acknowledge that what's happening near those borders does involve agencies and organizations that are across the, the county lines. Um, we have full intention of ensuring that we um, capture and work with those folks and they, they, they have the same intent with us. Okay, that's good to hear. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ponder. Uh, Councillor Silver, you're next. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Warden. Um, I, I'm really uh, impressed by the amount of work that the plan has done um, so far, but um, th this agreement, I think, you know, it, it leaves a lot of questions and, you know, agreements should define roles and responsibilities and processes and not um, you know, raise questions. So in particular, you know, the, the roles of the various um, people like the coordinator, the, um, the committee, um, they, they aren't really well defined or, or nor are the processes. Um, for instance, at paragraph two, it says the role of Bruce County and Gray County will be to facilitate the process for regional initiatives or strategies. Well, does that mean they decide or what, you know, facilitate is a pretty broad word. And then the next sentence says, the role of the Bruce municipalities and the Gray municipalities shall be to support any initiatives. So does that mean financial support, um, you know, or, or, you know, are we, if the municipality lower tier signs this agreement as written, then they're committed to support what it's ever been proposed um, somehow, but how those regional initiatives or strategies are proposed and approved, it's not clear. Similarly, on the financing part, I believe there's a typo there. Um, on the last line of paragraph three, it says, which additional funding to be reviewed? Okay. I think that means it should be with additional funding to be reviewed annually. But it doesn't say, um, you know, how budgets are presented um, and how they're approved, who approves them. <clears throat> it, you know, the, the work would come from the um, committee and then would somehow go to the counties for approval. And then, you know, the, the funding request would, the funding would be, request would go to the lower tiers or or, you know, it, it's the processes are really unclear in terms of a, a legal agreement. This raises more questions than it answers. So, um, you know, I would, I would hope that, um, you know, it could be tightened up so that it actually does say, okay, this is the process. These are, this is where the programs and initiatives are, are brought forward. This is who decides on them. This is where the budget requests are made, and, and this is the process for funding, because that would, you know, clarify all the roles. Because um, right now, it, it's there. You know, the agreement doesn't say much, um, really. It's you know, it talks about the funding that has happened. It talks about the initiatives, but you know, when it talks about the municipalities, the role shall be to support. Um, does that mean just verbal support, financial support? It, you know, it's, it's really unclear to me. So I, I would hope that, um, you know, it could be tightened up a little bit because agreements should solve problems and not create them. 
Sure, thank you um, for those comments um, through you, Mr. Warden. Um, we know it's very vague and it is definitely, uh, we're waiting for direction from the Ministry of Solicitor General. There, There is a good deal of information that we're waiting for for our outcomes. We don't have any of that yet. Um, they delayed that, of course, uh, to come in after they've received all of our plans. And so I hope to be back to you soon with the information. I'm not hearing of a further, um, a further uh, reschedule, uh, although I do know some of our colleague municipalities, because of the ongoing uh, work with COVID, have requested a, a further extension. That wasn't the intention locally. We are so uh, connected that we thought it was so important to keep the work moving forward. But you're not wrong, um, Councillor. There is definitely room for us to tighten that up with the with the duties and the roles. This gets us through to the end of the year, allows for the, the implementation and the rest of the work we're doing right now to move forward. And then we would be looking at redefining and putting outcome measurements and uh, uh, further directions from the Ministry of Solicitor General right to, uh, to be contained within the document. Thank you, Councillor Milne. Thank you, Mr. Warden. And uh, I just wanted to, uh, to say uh, thank you to Barb and her group for the hard work and the volume of work. I can only imagine what it must be like to try to get 18 elected bodies going in the same direction. It can't be easy. It isn't easy. And I do appreciate her efforts to see this, this project through to completion and opera operations. So thank you, Barb. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Councilor Mellon. I believe it's uh, 16 um, municipalities, right? 16 and two counties. Right, oh, right, so that's right. So I, if I could ask a question around that, how does our Indigenous communities play into the community safety and well-being regime? Yes, thank you for the question, Mr. Warden. We have had um, opportunity to outreach. We um, have engagement with some board members who are um, board members of Mawikwadong as well. Um, we continue to do uh, at, at um, the initiative level, at the, at the action table level, um, those kinds of outreach. It's, it's um, something that's uh, on our uh, work plan to do better, to do more. Um, some of the data was not easy to gather. And uh, we know that our partners do have data that, that will be very important and relevant. So it's definitely something that um, we're looking towards uh, partnerships with um, our Indigenous, our indigenous uh, neighbours. Um, the Mennonite population as well. There's a, a, a number of populations in our in our two counties that we know we we could gather more information and then work towards uh, some um, improved uh, improved outcomes based on um, some of the risks that have been identified. Thank you, Barb. Um, uh, Councillor Mackey. Thanks, Mr. Warden. And uh, Barb, I'd also like to thank you on behalf of our municipality for taking on this work. It's something that uh, a small municipality, it would have been, uh, I don't know how we would ever have uh, been able to complete it. So uh, collectively, uh, you've done a, a wonderful job and we certainly do appreciate that. Uh, just wondering, the, the composition, I think you had 72 members, which uh, uh, good luck to you in keeping the, you know, that number uh, actively involved. Uh, but with the changes to the Police Services Act, and we're going to be reducing the number of police services boards, will the composition be changing in the future, uh, recognizing that I think most police service boards had a, represent, a representative on the, uh, the working group. So will there be a reduction in the number of uh, participants? Thank you, Ms. Uh, thank you, Councillor uh, Mackey. That is a good question through you, Mr. Warden. Um, we are currently working on that. I believe the deadline um, has either come and gone uh, or is coming up for July 1st for um, responses from the police service boards um, to the uh, request to have one, one member um, based on the area. And so having, um, Having Inspector Krista Miller as part of our steering committee has been a, a real benefit to us because she's helping us wade through those waters as well. Um, there's, there's a bit of a challenge. I, I'm not sure everybody in Bruce and Gray are in agreement with one member representation. 
And so um, I think we have to hold and, and wait to know what that outcome looks like. Um, but you're right, we'll, we'll, we definitely will have to revisit. What we may end up doing is um, circling back and having an action table of, uh, of police um, uh, police regions, uh, the, sorry, the, the police uh, folks who, who can represent the various areas and then we can target some of the, our um, activities to be involved with the, those folks directly. Because each of our communities has slightly varied um, perceptions of what their risks are. Some of them, of course, homelessness and poverty and um, addictions and mental health, they're, they're straight across the board. But there are some others like speeding, um, you know, uh, certainly there's there's different, I, I don't need to take your time with those, but I think that there is an opportunity for us to be able to perhaps use the police as an action table, separate and apart from the situation table, which is another table that police and agencies sit at to work through of individuals in crises. Thank you. I don't see anyone else, Madam Clerk. No, sir. Excellent. Then I think it's time to call the question. Is there anyone opposed to the motion as presented? Seeing none, I'll say that that is carried. Thank you very much. Okay, we're on to item number seven, which is other business. Is there any other business? I see Councillor Desai. Ah, Councillor Desai, go ahead. Thank you, Warden Hicks. Um, so uh, I'm sure CAO Wingrove is getting tired of this question by now, but th there has been developments since the, since the last meeting in terms of uh, the, the recovery. Uh, and I was just wondering if, uh, if the CAO had a better idea uh, at the end of this meeting as compared to the last one as to whether we will be able to get back into council chambers in some form or another. Um, either in step one, two, or three, uh, or if we'll have to wait further. Um, and then just to provide some context, I have heard uh, from, from OGRA that uh, they're hoping to plan the September meeting, well, not hoping, they're hoping to hold the September meetings in person in Toronto. Um, and uh, they've, to that extent, they've, they've gone ahead and, uh, and uh, booked uh, hotel rooms for, for board members. So I'm just wondering if, uh, if there's the light at the end of this tunnel, uh, because yeah, I, I'm sure I'm not the only one for whom Zoom is getting a little tired. So thank you, Gordon Hicks. Um, CAL, you're muted. There we are. I apologize. Um, thank you for the question, Councillor Desai. Yes, I think we're all very anxious to uh, turn the page on this and, and get back to meeting in person. Um, my sense of things based on um, both the, the provincial uh, reopening plans um, and the direction that we're hearing from public health, et cetera, is that we should be looking at, at phase three. So I think we are still in that August, September timeframe to be coming back to um, in-person meetings. So we want to make sure that we're aligned with the, the reopening from the province that you know a full reopening is, is um, on the table. Uh, we wanna make sure that everybody's had the opportunity to be fully vaccinated. Um, I think those just to ensure everyone's safety. So those are our key considerations and um, we're looking forward to being able to reach that milestone and, and bring everyone back. Um, we will make sure that everyone gets lots of notice, though, uh, about that so that you can uh, plan your schedules um, in advance. Thank I'll, you. I'll, I'll just thank you. Thank you for that response, CAO. Um, I'll just say if, if you called me the Wednesday evening and said we're, we're having our meeting in person tomorrow, I will be there. You'd be there. I will, yeah. I will move. I will move the planets around to make it happen. So uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Desai. And I would uh, also indicate, I think that some of the lower tiers had um, uh, indicated that they would be following the lead of the county. So that'll be important that uh, if we're moving in that direction, then I'll give some confidence to some of the lower tiers who've indicated that they will watch to see what the county does. Uh, any other, sorry? Well, Councilor sure. Millen, yeah. and then I and then I think Kim has something else. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Warden. Um, ironic uh, 
given the last question that we haven't seen Mr. Decide today, but anyway, that's just uh, an aside. Um, <clears throat> Councillor to uh, CEO Wingrove, I'm wondering, Kim, would it be appropriate, and I uh, have an update on the uh, the Black uh, Pioneer Cemetery issue. I I, I do appreciate your uh, your transparency on that issue and. Uh, and, and your efforts to keep council up to date, but uh, I, I know it's a sensitive issue, but is there any further updates on that, uh, that issue? Thank you, Councillor Milne. Um, after our last meeting, uh, I indicated that we would be um, representatives of, of this council. So uh, the warden and the deputy warden, myself and senior staff met with mem mem members of the cemetery committee that following Tuesday. Um, primarily to, to listen to um, their perspective and their concerns. Coming out of that meeting, there was an agreement that the committee um, was going to consider things and think about what how um, they felt uh, a path moving forward could, could be. And um, we have not had that follow-up discussion with them yet. I'm waiting to hear from them that they're ready to have an, another meeting. Um, we are um, hoping to have um, some discussion and potentially um, looking at the, at the property um, perhaps on Friday um, with a couple of them. So I don't have any firm updates at this time, but um, certainly there are conversations ongoing. And I had indicated when we first met that we did need to bring something back to our meeting on June 24th. So you can expect a formal report of some kind at the next meeting. Thank you very much. And thank you for your sensitive handling of this issue. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else from council with other business? If not, then I'll turn it over to Madam CAO. So further again to uh, Councillor Desai's uh, question about uh, about reopening and in-person meetings, I think all councils aware that tomorrow um, we start on phase one, which is the first step towards that reopening. And um, so our communications, economic and tour tourism staff have been working on some communications out to the public about that. And I wanted uh, to give Katrina Peridan an opportunity to just um, let council have a sneak peek at the information that we're gonna provide to the public. Katrina. Good morning, everyone. I'll just uh, very quickly share the poster that we have. And I will keep this short as I, I know that everybody's anxious to get going um, to lunch. So can everyone see that rediscover responsibly image? Great. Yeah. Yes. So this is the county summer tourism messaging. It's called rediscover responsibly. And the goal of the campaign is just to ensure that residents and visitors to Gray County are coming back and rediscovering all of our spaces in a responsible way which of course includes observing all COVID-19 safety protocols for the safety of our tourism industry, our visitors, our businesses, and our residents. We know that tourism is so valuable to this area, and we also know that responsible tourism is really key. Um, it helps to minimize negative environmental, economic, and social impacts, and really just helps generate greater economic benefits for our local residents and the well-being of all of us here in the host communities. Um, encouraging respect between tourists and hosts is going to help us to build local pride and confidence. So this campaign is going to be run summer long, uh, primarily through social media and local print publications. We're going to be directing people to more information on the tourism website, visit gray.ca. We've also got smaller graphics that are going to be shared with all the economic development organizations and municipal partners in Gray County. And our tourism page has a uh, a resource page to assist businesses with encouraging responsible visitation from their customers and their visitors. I know we're all looking forward to safely welcoming people, you know, locals and visitors back to our outdoor spaces and our businesses again. And we hope that this is just going to guide people to do that safely. Thanks very much, Katrina. Is that it, Madam CAO? It is. Thank you. Okay. I think that's it for other business then. And item number eight, any notices of motion? Seeing none, we'll move to adjourn. It is moved by Councillor Burley and seconded by Councillor Woodbury that we adjourn. Anyone opposed? None. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you very much, folks.
Good meeting. Take care, all. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Take care, everyone, even Councillor Mill. <laughs> <laughs> Give it up to Cy. <laughs>